Therefore, I just asked uh, some people to present, um, uh, to, to, to have the presentations uh, during our workshop, and only two of them were um, formally um, um, related to the project. Um, I mean, Jan Dauwe van der Plech from the Netherlands and Patrick Munay from the United States. They were both the part of the project team and they served, if I may say, as a kind of the external evaluators of, of, our, of our work. They are also uh, the authors of the foreword to the book. Uh, that's, it was done uh, by Jan Dauwe and the afterward, it was done uh, by, uh, by uh, Patrick, by Patrick uh, Mune. Um, so that is a kind of the, um, for, for other, for other uh, presenters were not related directly uh, to our project, but they are um, also well-known um, um, academics who deal with some aspects of, of uh, agricultural and rural issues um they 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 are all uh, sociologists as as well um so let me just uh, try to uh, briefly to present our our first speaker this is uh, professor uh, jan dauwe van der plech uh, from the um, uh, university in wageningen, wageningen the netherlands he is also uh, a professor at the in in China at the um, university uh, in Beijing, where uh, he has uh, the lectures uh, dealing with uh, with uh, rural sociology, uh, rural global rural and agricultural uh, problems. Mm, uh, let me present briefly um, his academic career. Jan Dauwe van der Plech uh, received. Uh, and a Master of Science degree in Agrarian Sociology and Development Economics from uh, um, his alma mater from Wageningen University in 1976. Uh, later, he earned his PhD in Social Scientist, Sciences from Leiden University, also in the Netherlands in 1985. The scope of his interests encompasses rural development, sustainable agriculture, rural transition and change, and peasant agriculture. He currently works as adjunct professor of rural sociology at China Agricultural University, that's the College of Humanities and Development Studies in Beijing, China, and he's um, professor emeritus of rural sociology uh, at Wageningen University in the in the Netherlands. Let me also say that um, uh, I was uh, very impressed uh, by the series of books uh, by Jan Dauwe van der Plech dealing with the problems of peasantry. And uh, I mean here his first book focused on this issue. It was entitled The Virtual Farmer, it was about Dutch peasantry. And for me, it was quite surprising. How can we talk about peasants in the Netherlands? Uh, the the, the um, Dutch agriculture seems to be one of the most industrialized types of agriculture, not only in Europe, but probably all over the world. And Jan um, claims that we might talk about Dutch peasantry, and not in the previous times, but quite recently, quite recently. Um, however, however, um, the idea that Jan uh, developed there is that uh, this peasant uh, spirit is among Dutch farmers, even those who uh, run industrialized and very intensive farms, because as they the Peasants before, still the farmers struggle for autonomy, for sustainability in the era, as Jan calls, of empire and globalization. So this is a kind of this uh, peasant spirit in, 
even today uh, industrialized intensive family agriculture, not only in the Netherlands, but in other uh, countries of, of Europe and, and in other parts of the, of the, of the, of the world. Um, I think that that's in this series of, of, of books, uh, I would like to mention also the last one, that's, uh, it is entitled Peasants and the Art of Farming, a Chayanovian Manifesto. So that's in this book, which I treat as a kind of the um, uh, summary of all these uh, remarks, all these considerations focused on uh, peasantry in contemporary world, Jan uses the classic concept developed by a Russian economist, Alexander Chayanov, um, in, uh, at, and his uh, theory of peasant uh, farming. Um, uh, he argues in this book, I strongly recommend this book to everybody, he strongly argues in this book that this uh, Chayanovian model is quite useful for analysis of contemporary sustainable uh, family farmers in developed countries. Okay, I think it's uh, enough. It's now 9.40, so this is, this is a high time for Jan to talk. Jan, please go ahead. You have 35 minutes for your talk. Go ahead, Jan. Thank you very much. Uh... Professor Gorla, for your very nice uh, introduction. And thank you very much, Christoph, for having invited me for this workshop. Uh, I think it's an important uh, workshop with a very interesting audience. I'm sure uh, there will be uh, high quality contributions uh, in the rest of the day. I'm uh, willing to, uh, to follow it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, wherever you are, very good morning to you. Uh, I deplore that we cannot be uh, physically uh, around in uh, in Krakow. I've been there several times. Uh, it always has been a pleasure to work together with uh, uh, Christoph and other friends. Uh, the Jagolunia University is uh, well. It's a nice uh, meeting point. Uh, uh, for academic debates, for academic exchanges. We recently had a very nice conference there, the Rural Sociology Conference. So I have uh, very good memories. And anyway, it's a pleasure to be virtually uh, back to uh, to uh, Krakow. You see, you refer to this book, The Virtual Farmer. Now we as professors are becoming virtual professors. We are virtually uh, present in uh, Krakow, but not really there. Anyway, uh, we all know uh, that there are three uh, basic features that define uh, the family farm. In the first place, it is the farming family that owns uh, the main resources used in uh, the unit of production. Of course, this is mainly land. Land has been a symbol. Land, having the land, uh, controlling the land, passing the land to the next generation is anyway a defining feature of the family farm. Then, of course, the second feature is that this land and the other resources are worked by the family, are worked by the uh, farming family. And thirdly, the main decisions concerning the organization of the farm, as Chayanov would say, uh, is organizational plan, but also the main decisions concerning uh, the development of the farm, in which direction, in which, with which rhythm, and so on and so forth. These decisions are also taken by the farming family. Now, we have to be very clear that there is a very huge diversity when it comes to uh, family farms. Uh, family farms uh, well, might differ very much in as far as uh, the composition of the family uh, is concerned, in as far as the size of the family is concerned. And I should add also in as far as the biography of the uh, family is concerned. And next to that, there is also huge diversity when it comes to the farm side of the equation. Uh, the unit of production might be small, might be medium, might be large. Uh, 
but there might be also huge differences in the style of farming, the way farming is organized, uh, as indeed already uh, indicated by uh, Christoph Gordelach. Uh, the, the way of farming, the style of farming might be more peasant-like, uh, it might be more entrepreneurial, and within one and the same country, like in Poland, like in the Netherlands, wherever it is, you can have next to each other more peasant-like styles of farming and other more entrepreneurial styles of farming. But regardless of this huge uh, diversity, time and again, uh, there is the family farm and uh, the three defining uh, features that I already mentioned, meaning that as a matter of fact, and I'm, now I'm synthesizing the three features, there is an organic unity between the family and the farm, between the, uh, the family as consumptive uh, unit and the farm as a productive unit. Uh, and this uh, organic unity of farm and family is decisive. And it also translates in various uh, important ways. It, it translates this organic unity into the unity of mental and manual labor. There is no separation between the one designing the labor process and controlling it, uh, and on the other hand, the others uh, executing it, uh, realizing it. Instead, there is this unity of mental and manual labor. And this is very important, of course. This is not just a curiosity. It's very important when it comes to the interaction with living nature, which always contains uh, capricious, uh, unexpected elements. Uh, uh, and then you have to, to deal with it. You have to react. You have to observe the unfolding processes of growth and development of the natural resources. You have to intervene. You have to correct. You have to observe. To analyze, to compare, in order to, well, to, to organize, to fine-tune the process of production. And only the family farm, this organic unity, in this case of mental and manual labor, offers the, the conditions, the, the institutional tool to do so. So for, for a, a nice, uh, for a beautiful way of farming, you need the family farm. Yeah, and this is true, that this has been uh, concluded uh, through the centuries, and it still is very true. This organic unity also translates in another way. It translates uh, as uh, the unity of those who are working and those who are uh, receiving the fruits of the labor. It is one and the same person. It is one of the same unit. It's the, the farming family doing the work and getting the fruits of it. Yet there is no separation here, uh, as in capitalist uh, production, no separation between uh, profits and uh, wages. Yet there is just one labor income, as Chayanov uh, argued, and this labor income, the fruits from uh, production, belong to the farming family. And again, here is a very important consequence because due to this unity of uh, labor input and getting the fruits of the work, uh, because of this unity, the family farm has been, let's say, an engine of agricultural growth. Uh, the emancipatory aspirations of the farming family wanted to go ahead, probably uh, in the past being able to send uh, children to school, later on to the university, improving their life, or having a nice kitchen in the house. You mention it. Uh, yeah, this, this, this drive for this, this aspiration for going ahead translated into producing more, so more fruits could be harvested, a better labor income was obtained, and this could be used for uh, at the level of the family. Uh, and the other way around, uh, having uh, an improved livelihood, spurred further production, allow for further increases. So there was uh, the, the development of uh, agriculture and the emancipation of the farming family coincided. They coincided due to the family farm. And this turned the family farm and the rural population, uh, the farming population, the peasants into uh, an engine of agricultural growth. And this 
was very important and it still uh, uh, is very important for the many underdeveloped parts of the world. Uh, yeah, where there is still this drive to go ahead, but sadly, sadly, this engine is now blocked for many reasons that I will not and cannot possibly discuss now. But this engine, uh, the theoretical importance of it, uh, remains important and there is still this question how can we get this engine started also in places where it is so bitterly needed. Okay, uh, the family farm typically is having its own autonomous uh, resource base. It's having these social resources, the natural resources, uh, and they are controlled by the family farm itself. Uh, they use it to engage into production, and this production feeds uh, uh, the population, and it uh, delivers the money needed for the family, uh, for the farming family itself. There is a, here again an important consequence, uh, a very uh, a consequence very relevant in these days of crisis. Having an autonomous resource base means that the farming is self-provisioning. Yeah, it, it provides the process of production with all the inputs it, it needs. There is no need to buy feed and fodder. It's produced in the farm itself. There is no need to uh, buy uh, fertilizers, uh, uh, green fertilizers, and especially manure is produced in the farm itself. There is no need to buy calves or heifers. Yeah, they are reproduced in the farm itself. There is no need to contract uh, labor, wage labor. Labor is uh, provided by the family itself. So uh, it's uh, and this applies also to to capital. Yeah, the farm in this respect is built on the savings of the farming family itself or the family capital it can mobilize. There is no need to engage in heavy debts. So the family farming sector is one of the few sectors of our economy that is not yet highly financialized. It can reproduce itself outside of the immediate control of financial capital. And this, of course, turned out to be already very important in the financial crisis of 2008. It now turned out to be, again, crucial during the COVID period we are uh, passing through, and it will for sure be an important feature, again, uh, when it comes to resolving the financial and economic crisis that uh, is the outcome of this COVID crisis. Yeah, so uh, the family farm is not something of those times, it's more than relevant in uh, our times. Uh, when we overlook uh, history as a whole, uh, one has to say that uh, the family farm, and here I start with typically social science type of analysis, the family farm is, family farm is a very uh, important institution, to be more precise and echoing Andrew Pierce, a rural sociologist uh, who did major works in uh, in the 1960s, uh, and I think I'm echoing uh, Galensky as well, a Polish uh, rural sociologist. The family farm is an important uh, land labor institution. It ties land and labor, the social and the natural resources, together in a specific way. And it ties uh, uh, them together in a persistent and sustainable way that is able yeah, this, this institution is able to resist uh, major and abrupt changes in society and it is able to adapt to different ecosystems and this explains the continuity of family farms uh, over the over the centuries. Yeah, it has been an institute that was with us for a long time and probably it will uh, remain to be with us and probably we will uh, again be very proud uh, on it. Uh, it would be a mistake, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to consider the family farm as being uh, only a remnant of the past. 
it's it's not true it's it's the other way around the family farm is the outcome of long lasting processes of emancipation long lasting uh, social struggles yeah and it was created out of uh, these struggles. It was born probably the family farm at the periphery of the uh, Roman Empire. Uh, initially, it started in, of course, in uh, in the Greek uh, civilization, where the Georgios, the free farmer, was uh, already this 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 institutional uh, symbol. And uh, at the periphery of the Roman Empire. Uh, yeah, there were these pockets of uh, family farms, but they suffered still uh, from very uh, awkward conditions. And then there have been long historical historical struggles to come up to to establish more control over the land, to obtain better conditions in the markets, uh, to fight against uh, political elites that were subordinating and oppressing uh, the peasantries. Uh, there are two very interesting concepts here that reflect uh, this uh, this history, this long history. These are farming freedom, a concept coined by Sliger van Bat, an important agrarian historian, who argued that uh, farmers' freedom, peasant freedom, you could also say, is having uh, a twofold uh, meaning. It is uh, freedom from and uh, freedom to. It's freedom from oppression, exploitation, uh, uh, freedom from neglect, from uh, from. Jan, 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 you switched off your microphone. Okay, Jan. Well, I did not, but uh, the bloody machine did it by itself. But now I, you, you can hear me again? Yes, yes. That's okay. Right now, that's okay. Go ahead. Continue. Okay. So I explained this concept of uh, uh, farming freedom Yeah, that was established uh, over the centuries. The French Revolution played an important part in it, but many uh, dispersed struggles all over Europe uh, did so as well. Poland has, uh, is having a beautiful history in this sense, and there is the concept of clean part used in the first farm accountancy books to measure the difference between monetary uh, expenses and monetary entrances. They're reflecting a little bit the, the, the dependency relations towards markets and the autonomy, the, the margin of, of, of peasants and uh, family farms could gain vis a vis these markets. So it's not a, a remnant of the past, it has been actively constructed uh, during the past, uh, becoming time and again more like the family farm we know of today. And for sure it will develop in the times to come. Um, then uh, an other mistake frequently made is that in the end it's just very simple the family farm uh, well i would say this is not the case of course uh, on the contrary uh, there are uh, many uh, many balances inside the family farm that are to be adjusted uh, in order to find the right equilibrium between the family uh, and the farm, uh, between society and the farm, between uh, ecology and the farm. Uh, so this is uh, far from simple, just as the uh, development of the family farm through time is far from simple, it's not linear, it's a very complex process with steps forward and steps uh, backward. And this has been obscured, of course, very much in, op in modernization theories that brought uh, it all back to one linear process. Small farms disappear and large farms can survive and develop further. In reality, as we now know, it is far more uh, complex. We all know that in Europe we have uh, nowadays some um, uh, 12 million uh, family farms yeah, distributed all over Europe and it's part of our richness. Uh, at the same time it seems uh, every now and then that there is this 
this major neglect that uh, the best way of farming is to be reinvented time and again. And there are many claims from different sides uh, uh, to do so. Uh, when considering this uh, enormous amount of uh, family farms uh, that we have in Europe, uh, three questions can be asked, uh, and I cannot respond them uh, uh, completely now, but I will uh, raise these questions and make uh, a few observations. The first important question is, uh, what does family farm mean, mean for the actors involved in it? What does it mean for, for the farmers, uh, for the farmers' women, uh, for uh, for the young people uh, who will be needed in the future, look, all this is not self-evident. There have been uh, there have been periods and places in Europe, <coughs> especially in highly patriarchal societies, uh, where uh, farmers' women uh, said to their daughters, "Marry uh, whoever you like, but do not marry a farmer." Yeah, and where this was the case, we now see uh, the completely depopulated uh, countryside. So, uh, the opinion of the uh, people, the attitude, uh, their interests, their prospects uh, do matter. Yeah, more generally speaking, uh, what does family farming mean for the actors involved? The second question, in what respects uh, family farming is uh, relevant for society as a whole? And the third question, and then it comes to the future. Uh, will family farming be attractive, relevant, and important for Europe uh, in the in the future, in the in the decades to come? Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when it comes to uh, the the relevance of the family farming for those directly involved in it, uh, there are many. Uh, aspects, of course. It provides uh, the family with the farm, provides uh, them with an income, uh, with employment opportunities, uh, very often with uh, good and healthy food. Uh, it keeps a culture alive. Uh, uh, it allows for a certain autonomy, independence, and the contact with nature is always mentioned in whatever survey among uh, the uh, farming population as being very important aspects of uh, of their life. Uh, it provides also for flexibility. Yeah, this phenomenon of pluri activity, for instance, uh, farmers and farmers, women having a job and simultaneously working in a farm. It's uh, often they combine the best of two pos of, of two worlds. Uh, yeah, they combine it and have a comfortable position. And exactly the family farm uh, allows for this flexibility. But above all, uh, to use a Latin expression, the, the family farm is a domus. It is home to the people. They live there. They they love the place. They cherish it. Uh, they uh, they love to live there. Uh, it's theirs. Uh, it's the place they belong to. And as we all know, as uh, social scientists, uh, the the sense of belonging is a very strong uh, life in a very strong motive in in, uh, in social life. So uh, these aspects, and especially the family farm farm being a domus. Uh, remains and will probably become uh, even more important uh, when on the other side of the equation uh, the big cities become well the difficult places to live and internet uh, allows you from every remote farm to link directly to the city and to join many of its uh, attractions the theater the 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 films uh, you, uh, the, the the operas uh, so domus uh, is important and will remain to be uh, important. When it comes to the second question I raised, uh, what does family farming mean for uh, for uh, society as a whole? There is, of course, the generation of employment, of incomes. Uh, the family farming sector is a cornerstone of many regional rural economies. 
Yeah, as you have around Krakow, a living, uh, uh, vivid uh, family farming sector. I visited several uh, farms there and I was impressed. Uh, it also, the family farming uh, sector provides food uh, and a kind of food sovereignty to society. And here we have to stress the importance uh, this delivery of food comes with uh, continuity. Yeah, it cannot be uh, suspended overnight. Uh, <clears throat> capitalist enterprises will uh, suddenly stop producing yeah, when profits uh, become uh, too low or when there are better opportunities elsewhere. But this will not occur with uh, family farming. And then, of course, there are what uh, economists call uh, the uh, so-called positive uh, externalities. Uh, uh, family farms are able uh, to to reproduce landscapes, to maintain beautiful scenic landscapes. They are able to uh, enlarge, to protect and enlarge biodiversity. Uh, they can engage in energy production and water retention. They can enlarge accessibility of the countryside also by offering hospitality uh, you know, through uh, agro-touristic facilities. They can offer care facilities, so you mention it. And related to this is this new phenomenon, phenomenon of the multifunctional farm that spread very quickly throughout Europe over the last uh, uh, three, four decades or so. Um, instead of uh, being specialized uh, on the delivery of raw materials for food industry only, you know, the family farm now produces a wide gamma, uh, a wide array of uh, different products and different services, and this transcends also its economic position and its uh, a relative autonomy vis-à-vis -vis, uh, capital. And then there is this uh, third question. Uh, 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 what can it uh, uh, mean uh, uh, for the future, is, is it relevant uh, regarding the future? Well, if you look to the big new scarcities, the, 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 the fact that we cannot uh, continue forever with the use of fossil energy, we have the climate crisis, we will increasingly have uh, the scarcity of meaningful uh, uh, jobs, uh, high quality uh, 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 employment opportunities. Uh, uh, there might be shortages of food as well. Uh, and here the family farm, yeah, it can help uh, to cool the climate. It can further produce uh, high quality and healthy foods. It can uh, deliver far more employment opportunities than other forms of production in the countryside. Uh, and I'm very much aware that some family farms can do this far more than others. Yeah, and this also means that we as uh, scientists interested in farming have the, yeah, the obligation to search for those forms of family farming that are best able to meet these challenges of the for the future, the, to, to respond to these new scarcities. And of course, uh, it also depends very much on the question whether or not there will be uh, adequate agricultural uh, policies uh, to, uh, that, that will support and strengthen uh, the family farming sector. And here again, it's a big responsibility for uh, us as uh, scientists to help to design those policies that are helpful and that are grounded in a thorough empirical uh, understanding of this uh, beautiful uh, reality called uh, family farming in Europe. I will stop here. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Um, I give the word back to you, uh, Professor Gorlach. Thank you. Okay, um, many thank. Okay, uh, Jan, many thanks for your um, introductory talk. That was a kind of the um, 
best um, introduction to, to the ideas we want to discuss today. Right now we have, uh, oh, thank you for saving some time. Uh, so we have, uh, thank to Jan, we have almost um, 30 minutes for questions, comments. Um, and the organization of this workshop is like this, that after each presentation, we have both questions and comments to particular presentation, to particular uh, presenter. Um, there will be no general um, debate um, at the end of morning or afternoon session. So we st please stay focused on what Jan just said and the floor is open for questions and comments. Go ahead. Do I, yeah, Michal Lostak from Prague. I see your hand. Michal, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jan, for your presentation. It's always <laughs> very good to hear you and, and to, to hear the stimulating ideas, uh, especially in, this, in, in the times we are living. Um, my question is about um, what do you think how far the family farming is now under process. I, I still don't have a label. I would call it like like, but you know the the, the parallel is with the hypothesis of conventionalization of organic farming. The same is like something like businessialization of family farm. That um, you know what um, I'm I'm talking is especially the 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 issue of the farming transitions. Uh, I, I mean that not the transition uh, a generation turn turnover. Uh, and, and and the transfer of, of family farms, how far, because they, they are using, for instance, the partnership and different things. So in, in the other words, how far uh, we still can speak about the real family farming and how much they are exposed to those issues like uh, questioning the, the nature of family farming. I know that this is also the, uh, the question, especially in terms of the, the family farm generational uh, turnovers. Okay, many thanks. Jan, would you like to react immediately or? Yes, I can react to it uh, okay. uh, now directly. If you want, if you prefer, we could also uh, collect more questions and then I can uh, try to respond. It's all up to you. Uh, okay, uh, so are there any other questions and comments right now to Jan's presentation? Do I see any yellow hands? <laughs> it's um, okay. Yeah. Um, so please uh, react to what what Michal asked. Go ahead, Jan. Yes, thank you for uh, this question, uh, and it points uh, to an uh, well, an issue that's always there, but especially nowadays, it's uh, very much debated. That is uh, the with the premise that uh, family farming always is changing, uh, sometimes slowly, hardly visible, sometimes abruptly uh, and highly visible, uh, uh, and often uh, changing through a complex panorama that produces confusion. Uh, but then, of course, uh, the question always is, uh, how does it change? Uh, what are the underlying mechanisms? Uh, and and then, related to this, we have to understand these processes of change, also as processes of selection. So new solutions are tried out, some fail and others succeed. So in itself, it's good that uh, a change is a process that uh, passes through and produces even more diversity, because this diversity allows uh, you, allows the farmers themselves, but also allows us as uh, involved scientists to to compare, to see what, what is operating well, uh, what is the uh, impact, what is the outreach, uh, what is the promises that are carried by the different uh, trajectories. Now, to be more specifically, when it comes to processes of transition, and evidently we are in the midst of a process of transition, 
uh, although, and that's typical for transitions, nobody uh, knows exactly where we are going, but that things are changing and need to change is very clearly. Uh, it's clear all over uh, Europe and also in other parts of the world. Now, here we have to be uh, keen, and now I'm going to use some elements of transition theory, that uh, transition always uh, passes uh, through uh, what is called monstrosities. Monstrosities are, are the ugly things uh, that cannot be theoretically well explained, that are not well delineated. Uh, let me refer to the transition from sailing ships to steam uh, ships. Yeah, in between you had uh, ships that both had a steam engine and had uh, masts and sails to use uh, wind energy. Now, this meant a double investment. Yeah, you had to uh, pay for the sales and you had to pay for the steam engines. Yeah, this, this was a monstrosity, a double investment, but it was needed because uh, not everywhere you had the facilities for steam ships to obtain the coal to feed the engine, and sometimes there was period uh, and, and, and parts of the sea without winds. Uh, so, so this monstrosity was needed. Now, I think nowadays we are having many monstrosities as well. You have farms, uh, they abound, for instance, in the Netherlands, but also in France, in Germany, in Italy, that on the one hand are delivering to the big commodity markets. Yeah, on the one hand, they have an industrial, industrialized uh, production. On the other hand, they are also trying out high quality, craft-like production, they are delivering this to local markets. So you have this strange combination delivering to <coughs> the big uh, markets controlled by uh, food empires and at the same time producing for small markets, uh, having direct contacts. That is, in a way, are monstrosities. Yeah, you ask yourself, what are you doing, where are you going to? Are you, are you uh, not having the possibility to decide? Of course not. This is inherent to periods of transition and inherent to uh, 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 positions of uh, transitions. It's also a second uh, phenomenon that uh, what seems to be right and what to be wrong changes over time. Uh, we had the emergence of organic agriculture and then part of it conventionalized. At the same time, of course, part of it <coughs> developed uh, towards agroecology, which is a new radical version yeah, of organic agriculture. Not, it's not just agriculture without uh, chemical inputs, but it's understood in, in, in wider terms as an, economy, as, 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 as an economy of opposition. You see? So here you have contradictory uh, trends as well. And uh, here, there is an important task for us as social scientists, I keep repeating this, uh, to, un to unravel these this complexities, to explain the need for monstrosities, and anyway, to point to the possibilities that we have ahead. Uh, uh, so, uh, that is where we are, in the midst of uh, confusing, confusion and trying to make a sense out of it. Uh, that is the uh, answer uh, I can uh, give uh, you. Uh, I could go to a more uh, uh, personal stance, say what I favor, uh, but, but that's not the point. Uh, each of us can make uh, up his own, his or her own mind. Uh, what we need to share are the methodological and conceptual tools that help us to elaborate uh, a position that makes uh, sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. I see that Imre Kovac, in the meantime, Imre Kovac from Budapest joined us. Welcome. Um, Imre, um, Imre, could you switch off your camera? Could you switch off your camera? <clears throat> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, guys, we have still plenty of time for questions, comments reactions so who is next do i see any yellow hands <clears throat> please go ahead the floor is yours 
<clears throat> okay, if, if not, I have two questions um, uh, to Jan. Um, the first one is, uh, what is the role of uh, different types of institutions in this process of promoting more sustainable uh, agriculture? Um, uh, on the one hand, do you see any important role for nation states? Uh, and uh, on the one hand, and uh, uh, to some other um, transnational institutions or multinational organizations. Um, uh, and on the other hand, what is the role of the self-organization of farmers, um, like I think that, that Via Campesina, this is a kind of the good example um, uh, and um, important actor in this in this process. So this is the first the first question. And the second question is that traditionally this this modern family farming um, is uh, located in Europe and in North America, in Europe, it has its uh, peasant roots. In North America, um, the, the, this history is, is, um, is slightly different. There is no peasant tradition in North America, as far as I understand. But so what is your opinion um, if you look at this, at, at this, at the issue you mentioned in this global context? Um, what 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 will be what will what what will be um, the, your advice to agriculture to farmers in other parts of the of the world? Not not only here where there is this big tradition, uh, rich tradition of of family farm. Okay, so to what extent your ideas, your uh, suggestions? are uh, helpful uh, for the whole world, let's say, okay? So please go, uh, please, if you want to react to it, go ahead, Jan. <clears throat> oh, uh, dear Christoph, you're, you're terrible. You, you, you provoke me to write a new book uh, with these questions. <laughs> these are very uh, big questions. Uh, anyway, I like the questions and I will uh, uh, make some observations, but not after having first uh, said, uh, having said uh, hello to Imre Kovac. Uh, you asked him to turn off the camera. It's a pity because I always like to meet Imre Kovac uh, and to see him. Uh, but anyway, uh, nice to see you, Imre. Now let me move to the questions uh, expressed by uh, by you, uh, Christoph. The role of uh, different institutions, uh, and especially the nation states, uh, yes, this is, of course, tremendously important. Let me uh, refer to a few uh, important institutions and also uh, the, the, the new developments we could uh, expect there. First of all, of course, uh, the market. Yeah, we had markets, uh, highly centralized, uh, uh, markets and uh, the traditional market was disappearing. The street market, uh, what the Italians call la piazza, where people meet, uh, do their daily uh, shopping. Uh, and now we see the emergence of new food markets, yeah, a new uh, territorial markets, new local markets, farmers markets. I think this is terribly important. This represents a new institution for making uh, products circulate, food products, and this can be very strongly supported by the state. Uh, for instance, the city of Rome is having uh, some 30 uh, Mercati Contadini peasant markets, uh, and they are located in very nice old architectural buildings, old uh, industries, uh, that the municipality of Rome gave to the farmers organization in order to be used as uh, as, as food markets, uh, food industry is to be demonopolized. Uh, it's now very uh, much uh, big uh, corporations 
with very little uh, small and medium industry. Uh, yeah, the entrance of, uh, has been blocked to, uh, to this industrial sector. Now here again, we could need new institutions. Uh, 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 the, the de-bureaucratize uh, the governance of rural areas. Uh, yeah, it are now very uh, bureaucratic uh, systems of uh, regulatory systems uh, that, uh, that that try to govern uh, the, the the processes in the countryside and which are not very effective. Here again, we can we need new institutions and the state can be important in order to open space for this uh, self-organization. Here uh, you refer to uh, to uh, uh, to self-organization, uh, what we know in the Netherlands and some other parts of uh, Europe is the phenomenon of uh, territorial cooperatives. Uh, farmers together with rural dwellers say, okay, let us, let ourselves uh, regulate uh, our territory, we can do far better than the state. And interestingly, the European Commission uh, offered the uh, framework, the institutional and also the <coughs> financial framework that allows to, to start doing this. Uh, this is very interesting that uh, here the European Commission is correcting some of the member states and opening space. Uh, it's also important that uh, the monopoly, the political monopoly of the traditional farmer unions uh, uh, will be changed, that there is uh, room for competing for alternative voices uh, uh, of uh, La Via Campesina, for instance. Yeah, they have a fresh look, they, they defend the small and medium farmers, uh, whilst the traditional farmer unions focus only on, uh, on the large uh, farms. So, uh, indeed, here we uh, uh, we need we need many institutional changes, and several of them are already going on. Uh, but they are contested as well. Uh, so these are important uh, arenas of social uh, political struggle. Concerning your second question, yes, it's true. Uh, <coughs> the family farming sector it it is part of the. Uh, uh, European richness. It's part of our uh, uh, historical legacy. It's, uh, it, it represents part of our uh, natural, but also our uh, cultural capital. It's, it's human capital uh, contained in it. Uh, and in this uh, respect, uh, Europe stands out. And it's sometimes, I know the realities in Africa, in uh, Latin America and Asia, due to my uh, <coughs> uh, work. And uh, many uh, European institutions and uh, political elites are not sufficiently aware of the richness and relevance of the family farming sector we have here in uh, Europe. Uh, these 12 uh, million uh, units of, uh, of agri agricultural production called family farm, yeah, it's part of our richness. Uh, and it's missing in, uh, in many other uh, uh, continents or, or, or even less recognized than in Europe. Uh, there are here also the, the counter tendencies. Uh, I remember uh, a recent book that focused on uh, uh, migrant workers in the USA who used to be uh, wage workers, but with their savings, they are able to obtain a little piece of land and start to produce as a kind of new peasants. Yeah, and this tends to become an interesting phenomenon in. Uh, in the in the United States, uh, there, there, there used to be more family farming, uh, just as in, in Canada, for instance, uh, Harriet Friedman uh, wrote important things about it, uh, and uh, <laughs> it was nice. Uh, during the last conference in uh, Krakow, uh, there was uh, Annette Desmarais from Canada as well. She gave uh, one of the keynotes, you remember, uh, Christoph, and uh, her uh, partner, her husband, he's a, he's a farmer. He used to be uh, the head of the National Farmers Union, 
and uh, Annette Desmarais told me, uh, my husband does not like reading, but every now and then I uh, read to him uh, parts of your book, uh, The New Peasantries. And my husband told me, well, I don't know, but uh, I'm very much alike uh, these peasants of uh, Yandawa in his book. So, yes, <laughs> there is some hope for mankind, <laughs> or at least some hope for, for Canadian people. No, no, I'm, I'm now just uh, uh, making jokes. Uh, the, the point I want to make is uh, we, that we had, uh, more or less two dec decades ago, uh, an intellectual effort of the European Commission to formulate uh, the European agricultural model. Uh, and this was very much centered on the centrality, on the importance of family farming. And if you compare it to this new strategy from farm to fork, it is new strategy of the European Commission and especially of uh, Franz Timmermans, uh, the, the new Tsar for uh, sustainability. Well, one it, one has to agree, we need to move to sustainability. There is no discussion about that. We have to avoid uh, climate heating, no discussion about that. But then this uh, strategy, this new strategy from a farm to fork focuses very much on technological fixes. Yeah, and it uh, ignores uh, far too much the very important uh, family farming sector and uh, the, the many uh, promises uh, for sustainability it carries. So uh, we also in Europe have to uh, be very active in indicating time and again the importance of family farming uh, in uh, our societies, because without that it easily uh, is forgotten for whatever reason. I stop here. Uh, Okay, many, many thanks, uh, many thanks. Um, are there any other questions or comments? We have still, let's say, seven, eight minutes for quick questions, brief comments and quick reaction from Jan. Go ahead, the floor is yours. In the meantime, I see that we have new uh, persons who joined us. Welcome, Professor Maria Halamska, uh, one of the leading rural sociologists in Poland. Welcome, another person, Teodos Jadou Paras Paraskevi. Welcome. Okay, guys, uh, any questions, any comments? Final minutes to uh, ask Jan about, about important issues he raised in his uh, presentation. Go ahead. Do I see any yellow hands? <clears throat> Well, that's uh, uh, no. Are you familiar with this idea to to to, to raise your hand in, in order you want to to uh, talk? That's how this system works. Anyway, Jan, uh, that's that's. Let me just continue for a moment. My my second question. Uh, do you think? Do you think that there is a kind of the one universal model of agriculture, a kind of the global model of agriculture, or it's what you just uh, talked about, it's mostly about Europe and, uh, well, generally speaking, developed countries? Is it clear? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. No, I understand your question. Um... Uh, and I, uh, it is anyway uh, an important question, but also an extremely uh, difficult question. I mean, uh, to, to correctly uh, respond to it, uh, it is assumed that one disposes of a uh, uh, an enormous uh, empirical knowledge yeah, that covers different uh, continents <clears throat> and that one is able to to compare 
these different blocks of knowledge and to uh, extrapolate it uh, to the future. And also that last element is uh, extremely difficult. Uh, and, 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 and you see uh, new developments, but it's still not uh, very easy to uh, understand what it means. Uh, I mean, uh, basically, <coughs> this notion of uh, having uh, a social uh, institution like the family, uh, having at the same time uh, control over uh, a resource base, and thus uh, gaining a living, creating a livelihood, uh, is, is what you see uh, in nearly all continents. Let me, for the sake uh, of the argument, refer to China. Of course, China is in many respects uh, very different. Uh, it's, it's having a different history, but now you have uh, 200 million small family farms yeah, that are the, the backbone of uh, Chinese agriculture. There are large uh, farm enterprises as well, but the backbone anyway is uh, and that is feeding also the Chinese population and making for an impressive agricultural growth are the 200 million uh, small family farms. Yeah, that depend, nearly all of them, uh, on multiple job holding. Uh, the members of these families partly work in the farm, partly work in uh, industry, in uh, urban services, yeah, and they combine uh, these two elements uh, in ways. And it applies here uh, very much that this model was the outcome of social struggles. It's little known in the West, but in uh, 79 of the previous century, there was an important uh, peasant uprising in China. The most notably uh, known is uh, the Anhui province, but it was like a peat fire. It was spread all over China. Peasants refused to continue uh, to work in the in the communes anymore. Yeah, they said we want our own. Uh, a piece of land, we want our own responsibility, and we are sure that we can do better, far better than the collective organization can do. So uh, here, the family farm, at least the basic institutional pattern, re-emerged after a long period of collectivization. And so it happened also in, in, in several parts of Eastern Europe with more or less success. And many of you have uh, written important uh, uh, studies about it that still remain to be uh, very important. So once again, uh, the, the family farm is farm is not just a remnant of the past, but re-emerges time and again uh, throughout history, even to, uh, in, in contemporary history. But then we have to be <coughs> keen that probably uh, <coughs> the next generations will go beyond the limits of the family, especially beyond the limits of the nuclear family. Yeah, uh, probably uh, some kind of cooperative will re-emerge, young people working together in in, in new cooperative uh, modalities, yet that allow to jointly work the land, jointly take decisions, jointly uh, uh, having joint ownership, yeah, but not anymore through the small uh, uh, entrance of the nuclear family only, but let's say the social side of the equation becomes widened. Yeah, it, uh, uh, and, and you see already around us, I think, uh, uh, the first uh, sprouts that express this uh, new trend, that the first experiences of sharing, uh, uh, sharing responsibilities, sharing ownership, sharing the work, uh, sharing the decisions. Uh, this is also because the intragenerational transfer of resources 
in the land and the animals, etc., the buildings from one generation to another really becomes the Achilles heel of the of the modern family farm. Yeah, the, here the, the the nuclear family is not very apt anymore to guarantee this uh, this passage from uh, one generation to another. Yeah, new solutions are needed, and you see emerge in practice. Uh, novel solutions, a novel type of uh, association that that brings uh, more people beyond the narrow limits of the nuclear family together in order to uh, play a new role. Uh, you see this in uh, Latin America, where uh, fighting for 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 the family farm. I mean, look to, to Brazil only uh, in the uh, uh, over the last uh, two three decades, more than 400,000 new family farms have been created yes, through land occupations. Uh, uh, that first uh, know a kind of cooperative stage, but then uh, they uh, develop into uh, many family farms, but that work closely together. So the panorama is confusing, but there are many uh, uh, indications that there are two lines that are absolutely uh, clear. One is continuity of family farms, understood in very general terms. And second, uh, try to, to transform a family farm, to change it, to go beyond the narrow limits of the nuclear family. That is, that is where we are going. Okay, many thanks, Jan. Many, many thanks. I, I think it's um, high time just to, to move to another presentation. Uh, let me just uh, uh, thank you, Jan, once again. And I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Henrik Domański from Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. Um, let me say a few words about Professor Domański. Um, he is a professor of sociology, Institute of Philosophy and Sociology in Polish Academy of Science in Warsaw and at the Educational Research Institute in Warsaw as well. Um, his main field of interest are studies on social stratification and mobility and the methodology of social research. Uh, he is an author and co-author of tremendous um, amount of books, over 40 books, primarily on labor market segmentation, inequality of sex and comparative social stratification, with most being recent being on the verge of market, the Polish middle class, prestige, and many, many, many others. Uh, Professor Domański is also the editor-in-chief of the methodological quarterly Ask Research and Methods. Uh, this is a very influential uh, journal in Poland um, and um, all the publications by Henrik Domański are known uh, because of their um, very high level of methodologi methodological standards. Okay, um, Henrik, now the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And as regards my presentation, it is based on it is based on assumption that to get better insight into uh, social location of farmers, it is good to look uh, at them in comparison to other uh, categories in other social classes. I, I will do this basic on empirical research. It is empirically based presentation. The basic question is as follows. Do Polish farmers still remain the most distinctive social class in uh, class structure in Poland in various dimensions? Such distinction uh, was established. I did such analysis for many years and it shows, but it uh, relates not only to Poland. It shows that uh, farmers uh, have the highest degree of inheritance of parents' class position. And the same is true uh, in case of marital homogamy. They are mostly homogeneous compared to other classes. But uh, I will uh, refer uh, in first part of my empirical presentation to this. 
but generally I will look at, uh, at this distinctive position of farmers. I will uh, look it from perspective of lifestyle and culture. Uh, coming to um, question whether whether farmers uh, constitute social class, in my opinion, they do because they meet some criteria of definition of social class. I will not dwell uh, in this uh, into detail, but uh, generally they do because, uh, especially in contemporary times, because they are involved in uh, relations with other social categories on the labor market. Uh, they have, uh, they are owners also. This is the second and uh, also, they are uh, they meet uh, another criterion of being class. They are involved in some conflicts uh, or tensions with other classes of the state. Although, on the other hand, uh, especially in Poland, we have self-employed farmers, and uh, they do not uh, have they do not hire employees, and uh, they are. Uh, these are not involved in, uh, in uh, relations of dominance, subordination, in some hierarchy related to authority and power, and do not exploit somebody in this case. But anyway, uh, now they, they are more, to more extent social class than, the, for example, in, in, um, in some recent decades uh, under uh, communist period in Poland and before in former decades. Uh, as regards to uh, theoretical background. I refer to uh, social mobility, intergenerational mobility and marital homogamy. It results, of course, from, mm, from belief, uh, from a uh, strong theoretical argumentation that uh, uh, it is uh, inter intergenerational patterns of social mobility that constitute class structure, formation of social classes, because they translate into social barriers, social distances. If we uh, have got to do with inheritance or with, in case of movements with openness. And uh, the same is true more or less to marital homogamy. This is the second uh, most frequently analyzed uh, uh, aspects, uh, dimension of uh, social stratification. The highest marital homogamy, the higher social barriers and distances between categories. It also, uh, both mobility and homogamy, is definition of social class. Uh, 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 one of the definitions given by, of social class given by Max Weber refers uh, directly to um, uh, intergenerational mobility, not to say about Peter M. Sorokin, of course, and in the case of marital homogamy, uh, such definition was given in the 30th last century by Joseph Schumpeter. And uh, as, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, as I mentioned before, um, all results that I know, uh, results also from Poland, show that uh, it is farmers, farmers and agricultural workers that are mostly distinctive uh, in terms of patterns of mobility and especially in terms of uh, uh, inheritance of class position. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, yes, we uh, look at this from the point of uh, chances of uh, transitions from one category to another. Uh, they, they, they represent the relatively the lowest outflow from farmers and on the other hand, uh, relatively the lowest inflow to them from other categories. And the same holds for marital homogamy. It was empirically proved and uh, uh, this is what explains my basic my my uh, basic questions uh, of this presentation. Um, what is to add that uh, this is universal rule in cross country perspective, and also it almost did not change in time uh, until now, until this presentation at least in all countries, and. Uh, this is why I, 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 I could uh, say that uh, this class barriers between farmers and non-agricultural categories are mostly cut in the class structure. 
And my question is related whether it changed. Uh, whether it changed the, the possible reading. Henrik, reading. Henrik, oh. Henrik I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but we see uh, only the first slide of your presentation. Uh, so that's... Uh, now I I moved to I moved to to next. Yeah. Do you see slide named questions or no? I see I see this this slides theoretical background question on my left hand side of the screen. A small I think you should you should click the pocas slide. I do not have poker slide, I must say. Oh yeah, now we see with the questions. So I will switch uh, not to poker slide, but to uh, 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 but to normal vision. So uh, theoretical background questions. Uh, th this question comes from um, because this. Uh, homogeneity of farmers need some explanations. All the explanations that I know are rather theoretical or speculative, not empirically compared, but uh, it is explained mostly in that uh, farmers are geographically isolated category, mostly isolated as compared to other social classes. Then they have a rather specific type of occupational roles in that uh, they have limited opportunities uh, for conversion of uh, various components of occupational roles such as land, machines, livestock, education, qualifications and so on uh, on the market into marketable assets. The socialization is also important from the very beginning. Uh, 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 especially illustrate, illustrated by strong attachment to soil and to farm, which is not uh, applicable, of course, to other social classes. Of course, intergenerational transmission of property, which means land, is another explanation. Their social isolation and uh, social distances from other categories, and also cultural distinctions related to traditional values and generally conservatism. Uh, this is on the one hand, but uh, uh, in my presentation I will focus on cultural patterns. Mm, uh, this, is, uh, this refers mostly to cultural activity and cultural uh, tastes. Mm, and as far as I know, mostly from Poland, because in other countries, uh, Farming category and agricultural workers are mostly negligent category because they are linked uh, for various reasons with other social classes. So we do not have good data to uh, confirm uh, uh, my diagnosis that it is some universal rule, but I believe they do also in cultural activity and cultural tastes. And I will show how it looks like in, the, in Poland. Mm which is uh, uh, mostly proved as regards uh, as regards isolation of farmers. And uh, my predictions, my predictions concerning this uh, analysis that uh, on the one hand, many things should act uh, on the part to decline this uh, detachment on farmers from other social categories and social classes. From what you see, growing communication, growing globalization in overall, uh, migrations, uh, effect of westernization of culture, as regards culture, rising standard of uh, material living on farmers, uh, which is obvious, uh, which may reduce uh, class barriers uh, related to other dimensions of stratification. These are um, these are things that uh, should work in uh, in uh, this direction of uh, uh, declining detachment of, of farmers from other social classes. But on the other hand, and I believe rather, and it will be proved as you see, I believe that they are still that uh, geographical isolation of countryside, of farmers, and also distinction of occupational roles and what they are doing every day. 
is most important and maybe it uh, retains their um, their uh, distance uh, uh, between them and other social classes. Uh, to prove, uh, to determine these questions, I will use data. First data concerning cultural tastes and cultural differentiation, distinction of farmers refers to data from 2019. Uh, we did research um, based on national sample. Uh, uh, the response rate was according to the contemporary standards maybe not bad but not good of course but anyway we get uh, about uh, 2000 cases 2007 uh, it was also of course uh, random sampled uh, uh, population mm. but also in case when i use data on mobility and uh, differentiation of earnings i use all the data from the polish general social survey carried out until 2010 and from a, a, another research that uh, uh, myself and my team carried out in 2013. Uh, uh, these are data on incomes and earnings in Poland. As regards variables uh, concerning cultural uh, practices, practices and cultural tastes, uh, we ask many questions concerning this and uh, to construct dependent variables. In some cases, I, I, I uh, combined uh, responses to, to, to many such questions. I will not go into details maybe now. As regards independent variables, I defined classes in terms of six categories, divisions, uh, division on six uh, social classes as regards uh, fathers, mothers, and respondents. They are referred to so-called EGP class schema. This, this abbreviation of names of the authors of this class schema. I'm going to presentation. I, I will start from the basics of uh, class differentiation and class structure, namely from distribution of incomes. Uh, which uh, I think underpin uh, not only position of farmers, but all classes in social hierarchies and translate into many other dimensions. This is comparisons of data over last over last three decades. Uh, you see that, that this, uh, this distribution of incomes across basic social classes are, uh, I would say, astoundingly stable because the hierarchy is still the same. And as regards farmers and agricultural categories, I, I, I'm linking them together. They do not differ uh, generally. As regards farmers and agricultural workers, it shows that their family incomes, incomes per capita are at the lowest. They locate themselves at the bottom of um, uh, social hierarchy with respect to incomes. Uh, I, uh, had to add, you see that these are uh, logarithmic uh, uh, family incomes uh, to make it comparable across uh, time, um, which of course uh, collapses uh, distribution of incomes but uh, preserves this, uh, this uh, comparability. So they are comparable across uh, years. Uh, stability exists generally speaking. So one could say that even joining by Poland, the European Union, and uh, uh, we've stereotyped that uh, farmers uh, most really, uh, material position and incomes of farmers uh, mostly improved as compared to other social classes. The stereotype is not confirmed here. It uh, was stereotyped. They locate themselves at, still at the bottom. Almost nothing changed in this case. Uh, of course, on the top are managers and professionals, Polish upper middle class, Polish intelligentsia and intelligentsia. The same is true in case of distribution of earnings. As you may see, uh, one could also expect that uh, all these changes that I mentioned uh, above could uh, improve the uh, situation or reduce distance between farmers and agricultural workers to 
to uh, at least the working class, but it did it, as you see. Once again, I would repeat that uh, uh, this, uh, this, this kind of stratification, this dimension is uh, almost unexpectedly uh, stable across time. It didn't change, nothing. Mm. Coming to social mobility that we started with. Here you see a percentage of people uh, inheriting uh, uh, social class of their fathers. If you imagine, uh, uh, for example, if you imagine a typical mobility table, which is in my case, cross classification of six categories of fathers by six categories of respondents, uh, you see that we obtain uh, 66, 36 cells of such table, six by six, 30 cells. And those people located on the main diagonal from the left, uh, from the upper left to the uh, lowest bottom, they uh, are defined, they, are, uh, they identify uh, people and inherit class position of fathers. And this percentage is presented here for all of these social categories, six over the last decades. Also in this case, contrary, maybe contrary to some expectations that many change, that we have a growing market society, that um, farmers and agricultural workers are on declining size because now they constitute no, no more than seven, eight percent of the adult population. This is result coming from all uh, research that I uh, know, that I remember, that I did. The, the stability, intergenerational stability, may be astounding. May be astounding, but on the one hand, on the other hand, it doesn't, in my opinion, because they are, as I, as I told you, they are still isolated, they are culturally distinct, they have the lowest access to education, to higher education, and also to secondary education. I will not present here this, but it seems to explain this stability. Mm. So they are still detached. They are outside, in a sense, in the class structure. Nothing changed. And <clears throat> the same holds for marital homogamy. The same, in this case, I used only five mm, social classes of uh, fathers and respondents uh, and uh, these are people located on the main diagonal of these tables people uh, who, respondents who have uh, who marry um, persons from the same category also in this case although not to such uh, extent as in, in case of inter the intergenerational mobility the highest Chciałam potwierdzić, że dzisiaj o 13 przyjdę na paznokcie, bo nie Sorry. The highest homogamy, internal homogamy displays in case of category of farmers and agricultural workers almost well there, there were differences across time as you see. I cannot explain, for example. It's difficult for me to explain why in 2019 it could be some, maybe some fault in representation of farmers and agricultural categories. I, I can explain why in 2019 this uh, percentage is so big, 88% almost, 88-89%. But anyway, the, what is important is that it proves uh, general, my general uh, conviction and statement that uh, farmers and agricultural ca uh, cut workers are, are outside uh, main, the mainstream of class structure in Poland. Coming to culture, uh, I use only data concerning musical tastes and musical activity. Uh, various reasons stay for uh, important role of uh, cultural capital, culture general in uh, social stratification. Mm. From the be beginning of sociology, empirical sociology, but also theoretical sociology from Bourdieu, uh, not Bourdieu, but from Weber, of course, from uh, Georg Zimmel, then uh, Weblen, then uh, Sorokin, 
next uh, empirical work by Boudier and uh, uh, his followers confirmed that uh, cultural stratification is now less important than economic stratification and also prestige. It is confirmed in this table. These are percentage of people actively involved in coming to various concerts of uh, various kinds of music. Uh, do, two regularities emerge, in my opinion. First, that farmers and agricultural workers located at the bottom of this, uh, all these kinds of activity, generally speaking, um, but of disco polo concert, attending disco polo course, uh, con concerts, they locate themselves on the bottom. They are less active in this way. One could say, in quotation that they are less cultural in the case of music, uh, in descriptive terms, of course, not with evaluation, which is maybe explained by geographical uh, isolation, of course, among others, but not only, by many other factors. This is the first thing. Another thing concerns uh, stratification of uh, cultural, musical tastes, musical participation of people in musical uh, concerts. It is well known that we have got to do with something like highbrow and lowbrow culture, which extends also to highbrow and lowbrow musical tastes and musical participation. Uh, uh, Bourdieu uh, uh, asserted that uh, homology exists be between social class stratification and uh, cultural stratification which uh, was empirically confirmed mainly by that uh, representatives of the higher classes, upper middle class, uh, speaking exactly, prefer uh, art and dance or prefer generally like more classical music, jazz and uh, to some extent rock music. It also confirms in Poland. I will not present detailed uh, because it is outside of this presentation, but it is true that such hierarchy of musical tastes and musical participation in Poland exist, and um, classical music, jazz, and uh, rock music locates on the top, contrary to popular music and disco polo concert. And in case in pol disco polo concert attendance of them, you see that um, in such case uh, uh, managers and professionals are. Uh, uh, under a representative of, uh, among people uh, 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 participating in this type of concerts as, as regards farmers and, uh, uh, and, uh, and agricultural workers, because agricultural workers are also included among farmers in this case, they do not, um, they do not uh, detach from the norm, I would say, in this case. As regards another uh, aspects of cultural participation in case of um, musical activity and musical tastes, uh, whether people are buying musical records, uh, watching musical programs, reading about this, singing with others, listening to musical records, and so you see uh, what I mean. Also, in this case, generally, farmers, farmers and agricultural workers locate themselves at the bottom, at the bottom of cultural participation, using uh, their capitals, various capitals, to uh, be involved in this type of uh, cultural um, activity or cultural tastes. It doesn't uh, uh, depart from the former table. And this is also true in case of lighting. Now I'm switching from activity to lighting, to preferences, uh, to some to two kinds of music. In this case, in this case, farmers located at the bottom of lighting. All kinds of music. They are not only uh, the least active social class in case in uh, sense of involvement in this, but also must least likely prefer something, whatever it could be, uh, as compared to other categories. Uh, uh, but of disco polo, of course, but of disco polo. Uh, they like disco polo mostre, disco polo that locate themselves on the, on the uh, uh, 
bottom of prestige of or ranking of cultural kinds of music in Poland. So are uh, still uh, they are still some specific category one could say in cultural participation and cultural tastes. The last uh, part of my presentation, maybe not the last, the, uh, the ultimate uh, last, is uh, liking specific, liking particular pieces of music, particular authors, and so to what extent they like them. Uh, uh, nothing changed in this case. You see that. Uh, they represent the lowest preferences for classical music, especially, but not only. Generally, they uh, like least even uh, such uh, out, such presenters, such singers as, as Margaret in Polish case. As usual, at the top of this hierarchy of liking something, uh, preferences to music, musical, uh, musical taste is uh, located in sets, managers, and professionals, Polish intelligence. The last thing concert, uh, concerns uh, intergenerational transmission uh, of um, liking uh, pieces of music. I uh, uh, did so, I established this for um, from six classes um, uh, using uh, synthetic measures of liking. We asked many, many questions uh, and I constructed uh, 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 combination of them into, uh, into summary scale from zero to ten. The, uh, the uh, higher value, the most uh, the, 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 the more extreme liking of something uh, exists, and also in this case, this uh, data refer only to people who inherit uh, class position of uh, their fathers or mothers. So I, for um, all these six by six tables for uh, 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 cross classification of our fathers and respondents, and mothers of respondents, I established these uh, values for people located on the main diagonal, which may be interpreted in uh, with some, uh, some direct way, maybe. Some interpreted as intergenerational trans transmission, to what extent uh, uh, people uh, staying in category of farmers and agricultural workers, uh, to what extent they like uh, classical music, uh, jazz and rock, compared to other categories. Uh, they locate at the bottom without uh, without um, uh, any change. Uh, it refers to both to uh, people uh, inheriting position of fathers and mothers, with some ex exception of liking jazz or skilled workers uh, located at the bottom of the scale. I added. Uh, um, to this uh, liking disco polo, uh, to first columns. In this case, of course, uh, stayers uh, uh, among farmers and agricultural workers located at of the top of the scale of, uh, of uh, uh, liking disco polo. It is, it is the most preferred uh, musical kind of music uh, among, uh, among farmers and agricultural workers. And I added two other dimensions of liking, namely referring to omnivores. Uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm calling omnivores, omnivores overall is a scale constructed uh, from responses to an open question concerning liking various pieces. People uh, uh, who uh, declared to like 15 kinds of music uh, obtained 15, and those uh, who declare that do not like uh, any kind of music uh, get uh, zero. I transform this 0, 15 scale to 0, 10 to make it comparable with, with uh, former indicators. 
And in this case, you see that also in case of omnivorism, musical omnivorism, farmers and agricultural uh, workers located at the bottom, they, they are least omnivorous class in the Polish case. Um, uh, and according to expectation, the uh, highest omnivorous displays among managers and professions. It is according to expectations because and owners. It is according to expectations because uh, the popular explanation of omnivorism is that uh, omnivorous people tend to be more open, more tolerant. They want to know uh, various things, uh, so they uh, tend to be located at the uh, top of uh, class structure and confess in Polish case. And in the last col column, I present uh, percentage of people uh, declaring a specific kind of omnivorism, that these are people who declare that they like classical music and at the same time they like disco polo and at the same time they like rock. The such category is not uh, big in Poland, uh, also in this case, according to expectation, the most omnivorous uh, of this kind are owners and uh, farmers and agricultural workers located still at the bottom. My conclusions, my conclusions are very simple. That despite all these things that I expected could affect uh, declining detachment of, of farmers and agricultural workers, despite all these things, uh, they still locate uh, they still locate uh, almost outside uh, the mainstream outside uh, class stratification and in some respects at the bottom especially at the bottom of cultural participation and cultural activity of course in the case of uh, cultural activity and cultural participation cultural tastes i could not check whether it changed, to what extent it changed, it changed over the last decades because these data that I referred to um, were from only from my point of view. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Henrik. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Domański. Um, as, you, as you saw, uh, the very high level of methodological standard will be clearly visible, uh, was clearly visible during uh, uh, Henrik's presentation. So it's kind of the, um, one of the major characteristics of his academic work. Many thanks, uh, Henrik. And now uh, we have time. Oh, thank you once again for keeping uh, on time, exactly. So we have still um, 25 minutes for questions, comments, reactions to what uh, Henrik uh, said. Okay, guys, who, who's gonna start our discussion right now? Go ahead. Grzegorz Pory. No, no, Grzegorz, no. That's yellow hand. Do I see any yellow hands? No. Okay, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. That's the unique chance to talk with Professor Domański. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's. I have I have um, one comment and 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 um, uh, one. Okay, Jan, would you like to ask? Yeah, well, let me first uh, okay. express my admiration. I found it a very interesting uh, presentation, uh, and it seems to be grounded on very thorough uh, scientific research. Uh, that's the kind of research we need. Uh, I have maybe a very simple question, and maybe uh, uh, you very clearly indicate that uh, mobility in the category of farmers and skilled workers is different, is lower than the one from uh, uh, other uh, professional categories. And you indicate that uh, 
there is a cultural distance uh, amongst others in terms of um, musical preferences. Uh, I, I, I can follow all that uh, very clearly. Uh, and you see that everywhere. And uh, there are also very uh, self-evident, let's say, everyday explanations for this kind of phenomena. But in your uh, uh, presentation, uh, especially when it comes to the conclusion, you say, well, these differences in mobility and these cultural differences very clearly uh, point to farmers uh, or peasants being at the bottom of stratification ladder. And that is where I cannot follow it anymore. It could be the other way around as well. I mean, uh, high class politicians or owners of capital groups uh, also uh, differ in terms of mobility, differ in terms of cultural distances from the rest, from the average, but then you do not conclude that therefore they are at the bottom of the certification ladder. Yes, so, so here, here I have my problem, but uh, I'm sure you, you can uh, give, uh, you, you can uh, res respond to this. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Henrik, would you like to react to this? Could you, could you repeat your last question? Because I have problem with listening. What, what should I uh, explain? Well, uh, I'm asking, uh, I'm saying uh, that it's very clear that uh, the, the category of farmers differs in terms of uh, cultural preferences, in terms of distinction, as Bourdieu would argue, from other professions. And then their mobility is also different. Yeah. This, of course, uh, relates to having uh, a nice place to live, having uh, the property of the land, etc. But why uh, then go from these two empirical facts to the conclusion that they are at the bottom of the stratification ladder? Th 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 this last uh, step is not clear to me. Yeah, it could be the other way around as well. For instance, in the Netherlands, uh, there is cultural distance also and there is difference in mobility, but farmers are esteemed very much by the rest of the population. They are not considered to be at the bottom of the stratification line, but they are considered to be privileged people. But it is, what are you saying? It is interesting for me because I, I now, of course, works for Harry Gazeb, for example. Uh, on social stratification in Netherlands. Uh, when I'm saying about uh, location of farmers and agriculturals on the bottom, I'm thinking about mainline thinking about uh, economic positions as farmers expressed uh, and agricultural workers expressed in, in terms of incomes uh, and uh, also earnings. This is which uh, uh, unequivocally, I think, locate them at the bottom. Why? I cannot, I, I do not know why exactly. It was always uh, the same, the same pattern. Uh, I think that, uh, I think that uh, the market power of farmers, I mean, uh, educational capital and uh, possibility of translation of various capitals into the market value are the lowest. I cannot, uh, I cannot indicate something more as, as uh, far as we are, as we are defining the, the, this stratification in terms of incomes and uh, earnings in terms of uh, other uh, dimensions in cultural uh, stratification, you saw that they locate themselves at the bottom. To what extent it, it is confirmed in Netherlands? I don't know, because I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that farmers are not included generally in studies on social stratification across countries, maybe because farmers, <coughs> maybe because um, this category in uh, other Western countries are relatively low in numbers. They do not extend above two percent, two percent, one percent, one percent, and point, and so. 
this may be the reason and uh, but another reason it could be that uh, you are true that it is because they are uh, because they locate themselves in the middle of social stratification especially in great britain and in great britain for example in empirical studies on social stratification they are joined with owners with owners outside agriculture i was uh, always surprised but by, by, by such uh, by such uh, operationalization but uh, it may confirm your uh, your uh, uh, doubts uh, why po why Polish farmers located at the bottom. I do not know why. Okay, um, many thanks. Okay, Michal Lostak, I see your hand. Michal, go ahead. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you once more for uh, the presentation. I really enjoyed, especially yeah, well, also, I was watching, especially the musical tastes, <laughs> which I was expecting. It was all the brass band, but but anyhow, no, I, I wanted just to react to the, the discussion um, and and what uh, Jan raised the question about the esteem of the farmers, because I know that the, the situation, for instance, in the Czech Republic. It's a completely a different from the Netherlands. The farmers are really not, they don't have any prestige in the in the different rankings. And even if, if, if the population is asked about, I know it when we're doing, you know, research on the borders between Czech Republic and Bavaria in Germany. So Bavaria has a big esteem while the Czechs, farmers, agriculture is generally are underestimated in, 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 in public. And the, the answer mostly is the legacy of the communism. Uh, because it, we, we lost the family farms, which is not the case of Poland on the other side. But uh, but on the other side, you know, they, there was completely like business workers, uh, workers in the industries, but working in the farms. So they, 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 we lost this sort of in, in, in the national understanding of the farmers and, and that that was just but i don't know i i understand that for poland uh there was the family farming during uh the communist one then yeah. the collectivization yeah. failed uh so they I, I, well that's I, I, don't, I don't think we but but maybe we might some reminiscences and the, and the issues rooted back in the the communist system, which might explain that one, uh, the position of the farm, are they, how they are recognized by the society. Mm. Okay. Do you like to mention about prestige of farmers? Because I, I analyzed this question for many years. In po Polish case, in Polish case, farmers locate themselves in the middle of hierarchy of occupational prestige. They are not on the, uh, on the bottom in, 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 in this dimension. It differs from, uh, from their economic uh, position. But it is only exception, I think, uh, that improves uh, and uh, locates them better as other categories, especially uh, unskilled workers they locate above them but in many other respects they are still at the bottom this question of lowest incomes lowest earnings it relates maybe to some extent to manual manual work manual work was uh, always in polish case but not only in poland as we know uh, they gained the relatively lowest earnings and uh, obtained the relatively lowest uh, family incomes. Maybe it is related to this. Uh, uh, nothing more. Okay, many thanks, uh, Henrik. And now we have still time to have questions, comments. Please go ahead. The floor is still open. <clears throat> if not, that's, let me just uh, give a kind of the more 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 general uh, remark. When when I read the uh, 
publications uh, from the area of stratification studies, let's say, um, I'm always surprised that farmers are treated as the one category and uh, sometimes with agricultural workers, sometimes not. Well, it depends uh, probably on some preferences by, by researchers. Um, and uh, now this is, um, this is my doubt that if we observe uh, farmers uh, in, a, in a more closer way, we um, do um, uh, see tremendous, sometimes tremendous differences between um, different subcategories of farmers in, concerning the economic characteristics, concerning the level of education, uh, concerning also the uh, some uh, some kind of of, of um, um, professional experience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, now the, my question is, uh, Henrik, what do you think? Is it um, a proper way to approach uh, um, the analysis of farmers' position uh, in social stratification, in social hierarchy, just using? To treating them as a one single category. This is my question to you. Uh, absolutely not proper. Of course not proper, but uh, we have no other solution having 2,000 cases. You cannot divide farmers because farmers, uh, in, in this, for example, in this research consists of no more than 100 persons, maybe 120. 20 or 30, you cannot divide them into the uh, more detailed, you, you cannot apply more detailed classification of them, for example, on uh, having big land uh, farming, landowners and uh, small farmers. It is not possible, but uh, uh, you are completely right that it is not. But uh, as I started from saying that I will look at social locations of farmers, look, compared to other social categories, and I, I, I know the problem. But it is not using data from national surveys of uh, this size that we use. It is not possible to divide them into the, uh, into the uh, more detailed uh, categories. Okay, many thanks. I see Marta Klekotko, Dr. Marta Klekotko uh, from our institute. Uh, sociology at the Jagiellonian is now in a row. So, Marta, go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, yes, thank you. I hope that you can hear me. I have very slow uh, connection and it's uh, quite difficult for me to follow the, the whole conference because, you know, there are some some problems. I'm not switching off camera for this because I'm sure that then you will, uh, well, there, there will lose connection. Um, I have a, well, uh, when I was uh, listening to the discussion about the position of uh, farmers in the class certification, um, two doubts uh, came to my mind as well. So I was I was thinking about, and Krzysztof, you clarified it uh, a little bit right now, and I'm, and I'm just thinking exactly uh, like this, that maybe when we try to compare the position of farmers in different countries, we should also take into account the context, right? So, for example, because probably we speak about different categories of farmers. So it's not only, you know, that that it's uh, the same uh, the same opportunities they have in, in different countries or the same. Um, but the, the context is very different and they have different opportunities yeah, to, to, to act in, in this context. So, for example, in Netherlands, if, in, if they have um, if they are recognized by the society, it's probably because they are more like the um uh you know the, the businessman yeah Some, someone who realizes good business um advanced maybe more 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 developed and it's it's more related to let's say post-industrial or maybe even industrial society while in poland uh, we have this very strong division still uh, i believe between you know rural and urban uh, urban areas and uh, and we can say that not all, but the much part of of uh, of uh, Polish farms, uh, they are in the areas which we can, can call that they are 
pre-industrial still, yeah. So they are like the, from very different contexts, historical contexts. I mean, the 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 um the way of thinking, what well, everything is different. It's more like in the past. So 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 I think that we cannot compare the social structure from the past with the social structure for the future. I think that this is the most more development problems. Yeah, that we are on different stages of development. So 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 maybe this is it. This is my doubt. And second doubt is um, regarding the how much it is about class and how much it is about uh, once again cultural context so for example cultural exposure and i and i and i wonder if there are differences between um between a well, in, in the findings of of cultural tastes of of farmers um uh, which depend on where they are i mean the the, the area where they um they act yes yeah? so for example in 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 um, villages where uh, which are closer to the cities and for example where is the higher cultural exposure to different um, cultural amenities if this differs from very peripheral rural areas where there's no chance for any cultural exposure and no no cultural opportunities um, yeah. Generally, I share your doubts, and as regards disposition of farmers, something else comes to my mind, namely that supply of uh, farmers uh, in Poland, as compared to Netherlands, supply of farmers, I mean size, and this is very sizable category, relative to demand of their uh, products is. Uh, relatively big it is not comparable with netherlands, uh, netherlands and uh, it must make their uh, market value lower as compared to them this is something uh, that may explain their lower incomes and earnings mm, uh, this is what jan mentioned uh, asked and i could not reply at the time and as regards this reason that you indicated uh, mm, that you indicated that uh, uh, determine uh, cultural detachment of farmers and agricultural workers. This is what I what I uh, tried to uh, uh, to mention in the beginning of my presentation. That this is uh, isolation, geographical isolation, and physical isolation of countryside from uh, urban areas. That. Uh, to much extent explains this uh, this distinction uh, and it uh, would retain in the future uh, regardless uh, technological changes or regardless uh, economic improvement of, of this category i think okay uh, many thanks thanks marta for your comments and questions thanks henrik for your reaction okay we have still let's say four or five minutes so maybe we are able to take one or two simple questions or a brief comment. Go ahead, guys. The floor is still open. But uh, I would say that maybe uh, you have no comments to this liking by farmers and uh, agricultural workers by liking as case of music like in disco polo it uh, it uh, it uh, strictly refers to different values uh, it is to emphasize values of this category as compared to other categories disco polo and popular music and some other kind of music that i not presented here so it is not only geographical isolation and maybe economic deterioration, but also they represent different values, different orientations, attitudes, uh, more traditional maybe, or more oriented on uh, simple, uh, uh, not complex uh, musical tastes, which are easy to, uh, 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 to access, something like this. Mm, okay, thanks for this additional uh, reaction. Okay, any other questions, comments? Um, if not, uh, Professor Domańska, I want to thank you very much for your um, presentation.
uh, for uh, for your the contribution to our workshop. I think in, it's high time to move to another uh, person to another presentation. The last person and the last presentation during our morning session. Um, and now the, our next speaker is um, uh, Professor Alexandra Wagner from Jagiellonian University um, uh, in Krakow um, from our department or Institute of Sociology. Let me just say a few words about Alexandra. We call her here Ola. So I will be speaking about Ola Wagner. She is currently an associate a professor in our institute following her habilitatia in 2018. Considering uh, Henrik, Henrik is gone. Henrik. Okay, many thanks. Um, uh, so, um, Alexandra is. Uh, um, uh, her, her uh, scientific work is focused on the issues of mass media, discourse, as well as trust in dialogue. Um, quite recently, she is focused on the discourse concerning energy issues uh, and the relations between the energy issues and social issues due to current climate changes. She is also interested in, in uh, analyzing the most important issues on healthcare system in Poland, including current pandemia, a social protest of young resident doctors, legislation of medical cannabis, etc. I have also stress, have to stress that she is a kind of very international person. In the year of 2006, she spent a half a year at the La Sapienza University in Rome, Italy, as well as being a visitor professor uh, for a semester in 2015 at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, in Germany. She participated and still participated in several international research projects, including three of them under the EU Horizon 2020 program. She headed also at least three projects financed by National Science Center of Poland between the years 2012 and 2020. And moreover, I think she's also very active in organizational issues. Uh, in 2014, she organized the European Sociological Association Energy and Society Conference here in Krakow. And those who, uh, were, he who were here in 2017 during the uh, European Society for Rural Sociology Congress here in Krakow, you probably remember her as one of the most important persons in the uh, local organizing uh, committee. I think it's enough. And now the floor is yours. Ola, go ahead. Hello, and um, thank you very much for uh, having me here. And thank you very much for such a, a nice introduction. And uh, I see that I have some problems with uh, sharing my screen here. So probably you need to make me a host. And can you hear me? Yes, yes. OK, so I, uh, Olga, I, I have some, some kind of problems because uh, I have a communicate that I am not able to share my presentation. So um, maybe I will change now uh, to the browser because uh, maybe it will be better. However, it will be not possible to uh, use the camera. Uh, OK, so give me a second.
Thank you for your patience. I hope you can see now uh, my screen and I hope you can hear me. Can someone confirm? Yes, I can confirm. Ola, go ahead. We see okay. your screen. Okay, thank you very much. So my today presentation, oh, so maybe, maybe I will try, start again. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for your invitation, because uh, I'm not a rural sociologist. I'm a sociologist of communication. At least I define myself as sociologist of communication. But uh, as um, Krzysztof mentioned before, for last over 10 years, uh, I work in the field of SSH aspect of energy, so social aspects of energy transition and um, thanks to today's um, seminar I have a unique opportunity to share some of my reflection with you so thank you for that again and the topic of my today presentation uh, is towards the energy citizenship and I would like to reflect for a moment uh, about the rural areas and the role of um, rural areas in the energy transition in Poland and I would like at the beginning I would like to thank to Tadeusz Rudek who uh, provided me some uh, unpublished data from the and insight from one of the projects that is realized in our department. Okay, um, so um, the, the concept of energy citizenship uh, is a concept launched by recently by the European policy documents and European strategies and a European Commission called the European scientists to develop this notion of energy citizenship and to try to define it um, in order to support the energy policy implementation and the energy transition in the Europe. And I thought that this concept, even if it is not um, defined very clearly now, it is something that corresponds um, well with the topic of our of, of this workshop, think locally and act globally. No, why? Why? Because it is um, some kind of new thinking about the relation between the people, individuals, between the energy, between the community, and uh, in the context of the powerful narratives of the globe, yes, the climate change, the energy transition, maybe the new way of thinking about the energy and the right to the energy and the energy justice, etc. So um, the energy citizenship is multidimensional, but um, simplifying it a little bit, we could say that it is perceiving citizen as uh, someone more than consumer or voter. In the field of energy, usually people are, are presented as consumers, as consuming energy, or in the field of politics as voters legitimizing the energy strategies and the energy policy implementation. But when we think about um, energy citizenship and energy, energy citizen, we think more also about the energy democracy and about some change in thinking um, in patterns of thinking about the energy. So first of all, we, we have to say that energy governance change or energy transition could be perceived not only as driven by the technology or the geopolitical situation, but uh, we can understand it and the deep social change which is linked to the energy governance governance and it means also that it is connected to the participation which in consequence means the empowerment of local communities participation and participating in the energy governance process which implies some changes um, towards the decentralization of energy and um, empowering uh, the local authorities and the local communities. So it is connected to the local community. And if we think about the local community, we could start thinking about the energy community that uh, organize uh, the people around uh, being or, or, or having a potential of being um, the heart of the uh, energy community being in the center. 
And uh, it means also that uh, the economic um, issues are still very important and the market participation is still important. We have here the relations between the consumers and the prosumers, but economy and the market participation could be also an area when we can observe the social innovation and uh, the new model of ownership or the new model of, of business of, um, of, of business models, we could say. And it means also that it is connected with the bottom-up approach and uh, we appreciate more the social and local activism and the leader of change, the agent of change, um, who start to implement thinking about the energy not only about um, as about the commodity, but also in terms of right to energy, in terms of duties, responsibilities, and one of uh, them is to educate to educate other people. So better education about the energy and our own role in the energy and uh, the education uh, could connect the local energy issue with more global um, transformative, uh, transformative capacities. And uh, what is a challenge here, uh, in my opinion, is um, the change between some kind of potentiality which we observe in the energy policies and in uh, energy discourses around the energy transition and the actuality. So um, saying, s simplifying a little bit, it, we could say how it is possible that some abstract uh, and um, and the general processes start to be important for people. How? What, what could happen here? What are the mechanisms that some issues start to be actual? Like, for example, the climate change perceived as something, um, um, something uh, more abstract or more general, or uh, from future, or, or something that will happen in the future, maybe with a serious consequences. And it was actualized in Poland into the um, uh, smoke and uh, the air pollution problems and the health problems. So, uh, so here we could see that the potentiality um, is uh, driven by the, the idea of technology development and uh, new patterns of thinking and maybe reconstructing the time horizon past and future and uh, constructing different temporalities of the energy transition in different countries or in different regions and the climate change as the powerful uh, narratives now that the air pro the necessity of air protection etc but in on the other hand it needs to be actualized uh, through the economy issues, through the real social practices, the patterns of social practice, through the value of landscapes and uh, the health. So all these things that um, influence the life quality. And here are some general uh, macro factors that uh, illustrate uh, how important is agriculture and rural areas in the energy transition. As you can see here, or maybe the most important information is that uh, Poland has the very energy intensive agriculture. We are on the second place in the Europe and on the, by the way, on the first is Netherlands. So our agricultures you know, consume energy and uh, has a significant share in, in consuming energy. And on the other hand, uh, in Poland, we have also a great share of um, fossil fuels in consumed energy and um, with significant share of the coal. And it means that thinking about the energy transition, we should remember about the uh, rural areas and about the agriculture, of course, but thinking also about the energy citizenship, we, we, we don't, um, we don't, um, should, or we shouldn't forget about the resistant, because resistant, which we observed um, resistance uh, in the rural areas, and of, of course not only, but, but here also the resistance against the new technologies or um, some changes in the landscapes and changes in the communities uh, are the second phase of the energy citizenship. Uh, usually in the scientific literature, when we say about the energy citizenship, we, we mean the energy communities, the energy clusters, some very uh, supportive initiatives 
supportive for the change, but it means also the resistance against the change because it is also based on the collective action, the shared values and uh, building the community and filling uh, members of the community. And thinking about the energy change uh, in the rural areas in Poland, uh, we can see several um, important challenges. Yes? So first of all, are um, establishing the new form of energy communities, energy clusters, energy initiatives, and they are supported also by the energy policies. The potential of biogas renewables, yes, the biogas uh, biogas uh, installation, which means um, using the or contributing to the renewables and also to the you know, waste management or the circular economy. And uh, another challenge is connected to the energy savings because uh, the Polish agriculture uh, needs modernization and also the household in the rural areas need the thermal modernization of the building. But um, but I mean here also the electricity modernization in the uh, in the farms yes, and uh, using the more efficient technologies, especially uh, in very energy intensive processes like the freezing fruits or or, or dry or cooling fruits or drying grains. And another challenge is maybe a little bit for the future, but um, it's um, it's it's it starts. Uh, we, we observed, start thinking about it, is the electromobility in rural areas, especially because of the problem of the public transport and some kind of transport exclusion. So electromobility uh, with, uh, in the connection with uh, the sol photovoltaic solar installation seems to be a chance for the uh, rural areas. And another challenge is the necessity of securing the stability of energy supply. And according to some data I uh, found, um, many Polish farmers say that it, it, this is a significant problem that they experience the breakouts, uh, the, the breaks in uh, the energy supply. So it seems to be really um, important to think about the energy modernization and energy transition, including the rural areas. But on the other hand, and here I would like to refer to some insight from one of uh, the Horizon projects that, um, that we are realizing um, uh, still, Comets, we can see that uh, there is no clear definition of the social innovation that could be investigated uh, better in the rural areas because we have uh, the different um, the different uh, entities as yes, we had we observed um, appearing establishing the energy cooperatives the energy clusters housing cooperatives local government initiatives some individual inhabitants in, in initiatives like sharing the um, the the thermal energy between few um, individuals and it means that um, the, the terms of social innovation or the social uh, i don't know even cooperatives are not so clear and we would like to know more about the motivation of people and the reasons uh, they they decided to join the such uh, body or or maybe not or uh, refuse to join such um, as, as such cooperatives so um for us, it was quite interesting that uh, when we identified 100 agricultural biogas installations, only two of them confirm us that they share the energy with the neighbors. So um, many of them are just enterprises, not uh, not the energy communities um, in terms of uh, sharing something or preparing something for themselves. And. Um, what is also important that according to the Polish law, the energy cooperatives uh, should be established in the rural areas on in the rural urban community. And uh, at the same time, um, so, so we could say that the rural areas is especially important uh, for um, development of renewables and for developing the social innovation in the energy, um, in the energy sector. But at the same time, we could say that uh, when we when we observe the public discourse or uh, when we talk to uh, to people and when we observe also the presentation during the scientific conference, it is uh, it is. Ob 
obviously untapped potential uh, of the rural sociology and uh, in terms of contribution to the energy studies. Because even uh, when we think about the social imaginary of the energy transition, um, the, the, the most um, natural is thinking about the smart cities. And in the scientific literature, there is a lot of publication and research about the future of the cities and the smart cities, but not so much about the future of the villages and future of the rural areas, future of the agriculture. And when we think about the future, maybe it is more natural to think about the modern city than about the, the future farmers using the smart technologies, etc. So um, what I would like to say is that the social, sociality, uh, social aspects of renewables energy um, developed on the farms and uh, in on the rural areas are really important and we have a lot of of things to do here for example going be, beyond the nimbe syndrome which is the not in my backyard yes as the reason or the popular explanation for the social resistance resistant towards technology and um, maybe it will be more um, fruitful and the more um, and the more valuable to think about social acceptance not in terms of uh, the very instrumental building the acceptance or uh, in terms of persuasion effective persuasion or education but maybe in terms of participation and changing the patterns of the governance and um, also, uh, we need to know more about the quality of life uh, and the value of landscapes and uh, taking it and treating it as a rural, um, rural environment, as heritage. And uh, the, the huge uh, problem is also energy poverty. And uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to, to listen to uh, uh, one of the Polish ministry, Emi Levitt, and she said that over three million of households, mainly located, located in the rural areas, are ex experience the energy poverty, and it is a huge challenge for the energy transition also. So, um, so with, from the one hand, we think that it is really important and challenging areas of research, and from the other, well, it seems to be a neglected areas. And uh, now I would like to share with you some insight from another of our Horizon project, Energy Shifts, because uh, under this project, within this project, we realized the uh, research with the methodology of Horizon Scan. And um, saying briefly, uh, this methodology um, uh, was based on choosing um, First of all, we choose four topics, the renewables, um, the energy efficiency, the smart consumption and transport as the topic um, interesting or needed for supporting the energy transition and particularly the set plan. And then um, and we were focused on the SSH, social science and humanities. And then we uh, invited for cooperation in each um, of the topic, 30 leading researchers uh, realizing the high impactful research in this area. And uh, we also published the open invitation for all researchers from the Europe to submit the proposition for the Quest, research questions for the future research agenda. And uh, after collecting for each topic of over 500 proposition of research questions, we asked each of the team, uh, each of the team consists of 30 um, researchers, so it uh, was altogether over, it was altogether 120. We asked them for voting in the first phase and uh, deliberating in the second phase and uh, choosing the 100, the most valid or the most crucial or the most important questions for future agenda, um, research agenda. And what was uh, interesting for me, that uh, when you look at the uh, published reports, um, among these 400 chosen research questions, only eight are re directly related to the, to, to the problem of rural areas or agriculture. And 
even uh, that this aid are formulated quite generally and uh, you can see it um, here. So, for example, how can re renewable energy installations support the rural development of the communities hosting them? So there were only eight and um, well, and it is uh, surprising and it is something that we missed, I think, uh, I, I don't know why, because uh, the really the composition of this group was balance in the terms of geography and the disciplines and uh, the gender also etc so but uh, when i start to thinking about it why why this topic is not so uh, it, it's not uh, strongly represented in this field uh, and uh, when i ask myself the questions is for bodies renewables and why without the agriculture why this this area is neglected here and um, I found the publication from the last year. Uh, it was the publication, um, it was the paper published in the Journal of Rural Studies. And the authors um, call the researchers uh, to develop research exactly in the energy studies, but taking into account the potential and the significance of the rural uh, studies of the rural areas in the energy in the energy transition and for the energy transition and um, well at the end because that's all what i would like to share with you and um, maybe um, maybe i i should without conclusion i should um well finish my presentation stop my presentation with the open question how, what, what do you think? What is the reason uh, that the, well, I think the Polish uh, rural sociology um, doesn't contribute so much uh, into the field of energy studies? And maybe we should um, do something with that, yes, and to propose some research and to make this topic more visible in the public discourse and in the scientific discourse as well. Because uh, I see here at least three very important questions. Is what is the role and potential of rural areas for and in energy transition? And um, why this topic is marginalized in public, in Polish public discourse? Is the materiality of, of establishing, of creating the energy system citizenship is, is really important, interesting here. And what will be the future of Polish, um, of Polish uh, villages, of Polish agriculture? Uh, who will transform it? And is it a chance that, a chance that uh, the people who created the Polish agriculture and who live in Polish rural areas will transform it for themselves? Or maybe it will be transformed by the city residents and uh, the role of rural areas will be a reservoir of energy and uh, food, energy, water and uh, beautiful landscapes maybe for the citizen of um, city residents citizens from cities. So that's uh, that's all I would like to share with you. Thank you very much for your um, attention. If you would like to, sh to, to know something more about the project I mentioned here, you can find uh, the links. Yeah. I will stop uh, sharing my screen now. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ola. I think that's um, the plenty to discuss uh, after this presentation. So please, um, um, who wants to start our discussion? Um, already Ola saved almost 10 minutes. Uh, so we have more time for questions, discussion, comments before the um, um, lunchtime break. Uh, during our workshop. Okay. Yeah, I see Ruta Spiewak. I see your hand. Ruta, go ahead. Uh, hi, I would like to say that your presentation was very interesting. Uh, 
also because also because I am doing the research right now on the issue of food citizenship. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. There is so many commonalities between uh, between this uh, this issue. However, I'm ashamed that I was not aware that there is a notion of food energy citizenship. So I'm really glad that I could hear about it. And uh, in the in the concept of the food citizenship, there is uh, there it's concerned in the dimensions also of responsibility of duties of the the mm -hmm. citizens have uh, rights but also duties and is there any kind is there any kind of duties mentioned uh, in that concept for uh, related to the to the co to the consumers of energy or you mentioned something about smart use of energy so it might be this and there is also uh, in my uh, in my research i found uh, i will i will talk about it later on on during my presentation that there is a strong role of uh, city inhabitants in creating the alternative food networks and I, I i assume that alternative food networks are part of the food citizenship uh, process of building food citizenship so i i I would assume that there might be a big role of uh, of city inhabitants in creating the food energy citizenship, even on rural areas. And last thing, I'd like to say that there is uh, research done on uh, smart villages also within our institute. So there are some researches done on uh, on on new technologies in rural areas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruta. Um, Ola, uh, before you start to react. Uh, could you just uh, remove your your last slide from the screen because I still see your last slide. Yes, but uh, yes, because I have here the net possibility. I used the, the the button close your presentation, but it doesn't work. Um, OK, so I have only the possibility to um, to close the presentation, but then OK, let's uh, maybe let's let's try to do it now. Okay, and sorry for not having the picture here, but as I said, I joined from the browser. But okay, thank you very much for the very interesting questions, which in fact was uh, some kind of remarks maybe or comments and uh, the question um, themselves. Yes, I know uh, also that we have some pioneer research on this. Uh, I know, for example, um, works by Jan Frankowski from the Polish Academy of Science, and uh, he was focused on the on, on one village and it is uh, he provided some kind of case study and it was more maybe about the um, farmers resistance towards the uh, towards the new technologies and the role of trust in the participatory govern uh, governance but i think it is still uh, not enough yet they are first signs of uh, interest in this topic and we need to know more but um but uh, but thank you for mention um, for mention the the works uh, the other works from your institute I will check them thank you for that and as you said um, yes the the food citizenship uh, seems to be quite similar and the energy citizenship uh, citizenship is I think it is the uh, the no the notion or the concept on the very initial stage of uh, developing and there are some. Uh, some works on uh, on that also about the materiality and the cultural aspect of uh, energy citizenship. But uh, just uh, um, at the beginning of this year, there was an open call from uh, European Commission calling researcher to define uh, this notion um, through the uh, empirical research and proposing uh, the more precise definition. But uh, listening to you, I thought uh, that maybe it would be interesting to have it connected, uh, the nexus w energy, water, energy, water, food, yes, because probably in the, um, I, I think that probably they are uh, strongly connected, is the food production and the energy production and sometimes um, sometimes the, the, the choice between uh, them and sometimes taking uh, them as as, uh, as as very much connected and also the issue of the water which is also part of the food production yes, and the energy governance so thinking about the duties or responsibilities i mentioned on the one the education education 
uh, not only close in the schools, uh, but the education in the community as the education of across the generation about the uh, energy, about the climate change. And I think that the, this, um, this narrative about our discourse about the climate change has very strong normative dimension and uh, yes. it is obliging us to do many things, yes, also in terms of energy. So uh, we could say that some responsibilities will be um, quite general, uh, general, uh, general like, like for example, the general call to the energy savings is because now we know that energy efficient technology are not enough, um, taking into account the rebound effect, for example. So if uh, more efficient technology we use, uh, very often uh, more energy we use uh, finally. So, uh, but but thinking about the, the very specific or particular duties, well, we need uh, more research on it. But I think that in energy cooperatives, for example, it means the uh, some kind of contribution into the uh, ma material contribution or the contribution with the action or, uh, or or your agreement of the specific land use. So, so I think that. The, Probably there are many specific duties, and it would be great to know more about that. Thank you. I hope I um, I, I, I respond uh, sufficiently. Okay. Many thanks. Uh, many thanks, uh, Ola, for reaction. Another person. We have plenty of time to discuss and the energy issues um, are I think the most one of the most hot topics uh, today so please the floor is open for comments questions um, contribution to discussion about these issues please go ahead I do not see by now any 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 yellow hands. So let me Ola, let me just uh, um, ask my 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 questions. And uh, um, as I always have in mind when we are talking about changes, mm -hmm. general changes. Okay, and this is this uh, change about the the sources of energy using of energy, switching from one sources of energy to another ones is, is, is very, very important here. And if we talk about changes, we also talk and think about the uh, this peculiarity of, of uh, uh, humans that are uh, very suspicious toward changes. Okay, the, the changes brings always something that is unexpected, or might be unexpected. Okay, so um, what do you think? What is your, your um, opinion? What is your, uh, how to say, um, uh, understanding? What is the most important issue uh, in this process of, of the um, switching from, from one uh, system of energy to another, let's say? Okay, um, are these really technical problems or maybe organizational problems or, but more, are these sociocultural problems of, of, of uh, um, fears shared by, by many uh, people, both I think in, in rural areas and in urban areas as well, um, in the face of such uh, changes that are uh, and it was clear in your presentation, quite necessary uh, in order of the climate changes and in order of the um, uh, future road of the whole uh, world. Okay, so what is what is your understanding? What is the most important issue in this context of this complex change that is required? 
Yes, thank you very much for that question. I think it is the great questions to open the wider discussion and maybe I will have the opening statement here. Uh, but in your questions, I see three important um, uh, aspects that I would like to refer to. And first, you asked me about the fear um, uh, fear of change, and uh, the, which is connected with the resistance of change. And uh, I think that dealing with unexpected and sometimes with also unintended consequences of something that is already happened is maybe the most important challenge of modern societies, as Nicholas Lehmann said, that uh, that it will be the, the the most important challenge for future societies to to learn how to deal with unexpected and with unintended and uh, with uh, something that uh, surprises us all the time. And I think that our last recent experience with the pandemia and with the global aspects of the pandemia and the scope of it and how much it influences our lives uh, for many of us or if not most of us it was completely unexpected and we have to change is uh, in our lives in our practices and we somehow better or worse but somehow we deal it uh, with it so i think that People, uh, of course, it is natural that people are afraid of the changes, and I think also that uh, this is the one of the reasons that people develop the discourse that we call progress or the civilizational development to positively value uh, the changes. Yes, to some, it is also somehow of dealing with the fear, believing that change can bring you something positive and uh, something maybe something better. But uh, this is um, a quite general answer, but when you ask me about um, what is the most important, uh, I could answer like that, that when I look at the um, at the way how social science uh, and um, humanities related to energy developed for last 20 years, we could say that uh, at the beginning, the understanding of the energy transition, for example, was mainly driven by technology. So we um, had a lot of discussion how to learn people, how people should learn to accept the technologies, to understand technologies, and the technology and economy are the most important dimension here, are the main engines and factors shaping the energy transition. But then we realize that it's not enough, that um, in different countries, in different regions, um, the temporality, the dynamic of transition is different. And that it changes societies, but in different ways. And uh, um, so social science and humanities start to ask the questions, what are the reasons? and uh, now we have a lot of theories of change in the sustainable development area or the theory of change uh, also as some kind of participatory um, research and action and um, well, I think that the most important is uh, engaging people into the change. So uh, let them trying to even if not control the changes, because maybe it is illusionary to control the change uh, completely, but make people conscious uh, what's going on and uh, empower them to let them co-decide. And I think that what is also important is the co-production of the knowledge. So um, incorporating what what um, the different types of knowledge, negotiate them and uh, co-producing uh, the knowledge. And I mean here uh, also not, not only how the knowledge is produced, uh, but also what type of knowledge is produced, what is important, who develop the research agenda and uh, who influences that. And uh, if we I think that the inclusive process is important here. However, um, everyone who works in, um, the, in, in the participatory um, field um, knows that it is uh, very difficult to engage people and to make them really, uh, re really interested and uh, to convince them that they can have the real influence because they are 
uh, suspicious, as you said, and uh, many times in the past uh, they were they, they maybe they felt uh, betrayed, and this is um, really important to restore the the trust, the mutual trust between um, between people in the community, but also between the institutions. So. Uh, I don't have the, the the simple answer. What is the most important? I think that um, important is the inclusive approach to to make people part of the change, but also uh, respect their right to refuse being a part of the change. On the other hand, uh, we know that even uh, if we don't take a decision, sometimes untaken decision is a decision. Yeah? So if everyone um, in the neighborhood uh, are changing and we uh, still keep the status quo, uh, in fact, uh, in, in the context, in the general context, we, we also change. Yes, but um, maybe, uh, maybe it's not uh, intentionally uh, intended by us. So I think that... Uh, for now, it is important to make people engage, and maybe it is also um, the task for sociologists. However, uh, there is another, um, maybe the, another controversial thing: how much sociologists should be engaged um, into the activism? Yes, and uh, we had such a discussion with the, the policy officer from European Commission, and he. He said something like that because now in this, I, I think that in the energy-related social science and humanities, we have a strong orientation towards the normativism and uh, and even the obligation to being engaged for the transition and support the transition, the energy transition. And he uh, told us that sometimes um, we can be perceived as lobbyists and not as um, expert providing evidence and we should be uh, conscious of that yeah uh, Christoph, uh, do you do you feel i answer your question or should i maybe say something more no no thank you very much thank you very much um, um okay um do i see any other persons who want to jump into our discussion Please, the floor is still open. <clears throat> maybe, maybe some or uh, someone of you uh, would like to uh, give me the answer. Why do you think that uh, rural sociology is not so deeply involved in the energy studies, and why this process is not, uh, I don't know, investigated uh, strongly? Do, do you think that? It's not so important, or maybe it needs some special skills, or how do you think? Okay, guys, so who wants to react to this? I don't want to monopolize this discussion, but we have quite a crowd of rural sociologists here. So I have an explanation and reaction to the question by Ola, but I don't want, as I said, to monopolize uh, this exchange of ideas and comments. <clears throat> so, okay, I don't see, I don't see any yellow hands. Over. Okay, Ola, so that's, 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 I try to say, that, well, it, it will be also partly um, the result of my, my academic experience with the field, with the rural sociology. Um, probably, um, traditionally, rural sociology is still uh, uh, very much focused on farming, farmers, um, um, uh, farming families, uh, production of food, etc., etc. So that's maybe maybe the the kind of the explanation. But it seems to me, and it is the result of my observation when I participated in international conferences um, in the area of, field of rural sociology that, um, yeah, okay, I see Dr. Wolski, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for attention. I um, have one question, maybe not question, but um, one thing about uh, tradition and actual uh, research about uh, in area of sociological, rural sociological 
Uh, we focus on the village, yes, it's very important. But just look on actual situation. Um, it's very important to find some border between village and town, and really small town. We are, um, we can uh, actually look at uh, watch uh, at uh, something uh, very poor and difficult situation of small town in Poland. Mm -hmm. If we think where actually is border between small town and village. And these two area is very complementary. And I think actually uh, research about um, rural sociology, we must um, in this actual point of view, we must think not only about village, but if we think about develop of village, we must think about develop of small town, develop of um, um, town, but in area of uh, suburbia, when we have actual situation when suburbia going to village. For example, look uh, on area between Katowice and Kraków. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In sometimes uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we can say, for example, near Chanów about uh, we can say uh, about village. Actually, it's rather not possibility. Mm -hmm. If uh, I living on uh, Silesia uh, conurbation, and actually, if I look, for example, uh, about uh, old village near Wodzisław, near Rybnik, near Racibush, it's very difficult to say if it's village actually. Mm -hmm. And once happened in next time, for example, 10 years in future, when we stop um, coal mine. What happened with this industrial, we can say, of course, in broken industrial uh, village? I, I think actually uh, research about uh, rural, we must uh, look at uh, small town, really small town, near 5,000 people, and uh, look at uh, suburbia too. Mm -hmm. It's finished. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, well, let me, let me just... Uh, comment a bit what 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 dr volsky said that's i think that he mentioned a very important issue already mentioned by professor domanski in his presentation about cultural distinctiveness of of uh, rural people of 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 farming people so according to professor domanski there is a um, um, very uh, there is not so much cultural distances between rural areas and small towns as between small towns and rural areas on the one hand and big cities on the on the other so this is yeah where where is this boundary um i think it's it's um it's 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 changing uh, right now you right. let me just also uh, finish my my reaction to uh, the question uh, by by Professor Wagner. So I think that, but there is the new generation of rural sociologists, which is much more focused on on um, the the new areas, new topics like like food networks, food systems, um, like uh, policy studies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that that um, if you observe all of that, uh, rural sociologists have do have um, have not much uh, to contribute to the uh, analysis of energy issues i i think and it is my opinion it will it is changing right now and probably in in a few years from now we will have a lot of of uh, works done by rural sociologists or uh, rural um, areas on rural areas about this uh, energy issues. So that would be my my reaction to your to your your question. Okay. Mm -hmm.
But it is uh, it is something that is related to what I said, the changing the potentiality into actuality. Because of, uh, look at the public discourse. When we discuss the energy changes, for example, not only um, the, the energy transition uh, in terms of uh, shifting from fossil fuels to renewables, but also about the energy efficiency, the energy modernization. I know that many um, agriculture enterprises are a huge problem with the electricity the infrastructures which are uh, old fashioned and needs a lot of money to be modernized etc but when we when we discussed uh, the um, the agriculture doesn't appear or appear very rarely in the public discourse we are so focused on the mining and miners and uh, about the air pollution in the city that Sometimes, uh, well, I think that we we completely forget that the energy means also the consuming energy and using the energy as the water also in the um, in the culti plant cultiv cultivation, yes, and uh, the animals uh, and uh, pro food production, as, as you said. And look at the air pollution topic, for example. We start to talk also about the villages and in context of the air quality, but uh, the um, research conducted by Jan Frankowski um, discovered uh, that uh, the, the promotional campaign led by the municipalities or the, 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 the author local authorities was um, completely unsuccessful because they tried to, um, to encourage Polish farmers to change uh, the um, heating system because of the of the air quality and because of the climate change and people change the heating system but because of the comfort they didn't want to uh, use so much muscles and it, uh, using the coal is really difficult especially for older people yes so they try to live better and in the research they answered yes we would like like people in the city in easy easier way and that's why we decided to um, change the heating system so um, well, it's fascinating, I think, and I think that maybe it, this is the idea for the next grant, maybe together. Many thanks. I see Dr. Uh, Marta Klekotko is ready to jump into the discussion. Marta, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. No, but, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I've been just thinking uh, Ola, about uh, about what. Well, thank you for your presentation and and the question. I think is very important on how we uh, it, it, well we should I think uh, reflect on how we frame problems of sustainability, for example. Because I um, I know I'm not a, a rural sociologist, but uh, as far as I know, there is quite a lot of research on sustainable rural development. And the energy issues uh, are undertaken there. I even remember one of our articles with Krzysztof and uh, with Tomasz Adamski, uh, where in which we um, um, indicated that the problem is in inconvenient or convenient ecology. Yeah. So depending on how how it affects the life of, of farmers and uh, local communities, um, some ecological initi initiatives when they are found uh, convenient. Uh, they are um, undertaken, but if they are inconvenient, there is a resistance toward us, toward them. Yeah, and um, it's. Um, I just finished a report for for Ecological Foundation um, about uh, uh, Turnitsky National Park in south uh, southwest Poland, and uh, it's it's not exactly about the uh, energy, but it's more about sustainable development and ecology in in general. Yeah. And there is also very strong resistance um, against any ecological innovations and mostly against the national park itself. Um, and the, the, the big issue there is, uh, for example, the water. Yeah, so this this uh, local communities, they still live in pre-industrial um, uh, age. Uh, they lack uh, only 20 percent of the population has access to, to water. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they are just afraid of 
this is this conflict that you all are for I'm sure sure that you uh, well this is very important in sustainable development and energy issues and others also that uh, the 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 areas which are underdeveloped they treat very often the social um, innovations and ecological association uh, um, ecological in innovations as uh, something that does not allow them to develop yeah so, for example, the experts come from post-industrial age and they come to the village, which is still in pre-industrial age, and they tell them, OK, so now you are going to uh, be more ecological. Yeah? And for them, it means that they will have never access to water, for example, because uh, we want to have a national park over there. Um, so these are the conflicts like this, that why you, we cannot develop because you more developed now decided um to to stop the development yeah and uh, the 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 examples that you mentioned all of course they are like very very advanced technologies and uh, we cannot say that this is something that is we cannot call it uh, under development it's definitely development but um i think that this is also um how we frame the problems yeah so so and in rural sociology, probably we also uh, frame the problems um, a little bit. I mean, I would say that this is not the moment yet, maybe, for mm -hmm. this. Yes, good point. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. OK, thank you, Marta. Um, um, Ola, would you like to react somehow to what Marta just said? Or? Well, I um, I think that it is uh, reasonable, and I think that I have to check now um, the questions for of, of sustainable development in our uh, Horizon Scan reports, and I will see if they really could be applied to the um, rural areas uh, as well, because I think it is a good point that the framing here could be different. However, I still think that maybe it is time for changing the frame and to make the energy somehow independent or free uh, is, to make them more visible in the public discourse in the context of agriculture i think and to make them free to connect them again with the food and the water as i said before so thank you okay okay guys we are almost uh, done but we have still two minutes so one short final question to our last uh, speaker, do I see any hands? If not, I think that it's high time just to stop and to, we deserve, really deserve for the mm, lunch break. Unfortunately, the lunch is on your own. It was planned uh, to have a lunch together in, in very, uh, pleasant uh, um, arrangement, but unfortunately, due to pandemia, we are not able to meet face-to-face uh, -face, um, in a real world, but only uh, on Teams. So, guys, um, I think we, we might stop right now, and please remember that we have still afternoon session. We will start in 90 minutes from now, so I... I expect to see you on Teams at 14.10. Uh, it means 10 minutes after 2 p.m. Have a good lunch, have a good break, and see you then. Bye now. Quite a lot of already body of, of research done on alternative food networks. The, the greatest body of literature is uh, from the Western Europe and the United States. There is also, because it's, there is a lot of different forms of alternative food networks already well established. And in last few years, there, 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 there appear new, there appear new res, uh, research in also in central, central and Eastern Europe regarding this, uh, the, the issue of alternative food networks or, or, or general uh, change in new in food uh, in food system. Uh, but the issue of exclusion has been has been raised uh, in our region of you if our part of europe uh, rarely most of the knowledge we have about the exclusions are based on the east western and american uh, uh, research and referring to a bit different uh, circumstances 
Why do you, well, I think this is important because we already mentioned a few times today about the sustainability and uh, this is an also issue of sustain of sustainability, especially in the dimension of social sustainability. Alternative food networks have been established in order to create uh, more better, more equal access to sustainable produced food. Uh, I mean, providing access to, to good quality food to all uh, to all and also provide decent income to all uh, to all even including the smaller uh, farmers so the analysis if the if the if this if the alter, if within the alternative food networks exist exclusions and what kind of exclusions it's interesting to see if the, really the idea of sustainability can be achieved within the within the within the food uh, the the this this kind of food network uh, as i said there's a tension between what is universal and what is embedded in the alternative models due to social cultural specificity of given country so i will see i will take a look at what what kind of uh, what kind of ex social exclusions are general in alternative food networks and what are due to what, if, if there are any uh, as due to the our 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 circumstances what what is quite, of course known for 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 for, for most of you that uh, we 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 still function within post socialist context especially i think that in the idea of food of the alternative food system it's still the ideas brought from that uh, from that uh, from that period of, our, of the socialist period of our history is still somewhere uh, vivid most of the countries in this region were affected by different uh, degree of agricultural collectivization and creating informal system of food production and distribution as a solution for uh, for food uh, shortage shortages as well as the poor uh, poor quality of the of the food even if the even if the new generation of people uh, there's already generation of people born at the beginning of 90s who might not who, who of course don't remember the shortage of economy they still they still uh, as research shows they have a still very low level of trust uh, towards the state so the institution that governs the food system and towards the towards the other people uh, as well and i think that the recent situation with uh, with covid and covid regulations may only worsen the situation uh, so uh, we have uh, we me uh, me Wojtek and also some other researchers as Ola Bilevich, we have done a few research on uh, on alternative food network system and we we we, we thought that there that we can divide the, the existing food networks uh, alternative food networks into three categories according if the idea is taken is coming from our uh, is coming from exogenous uh, ideas like Western or American ideas, that the ideas that were already implemented and utilized in the in the different context, or whether they come from our very very our our own uh, context, especially coming from the socialist uh, context. Also, this is we divided according to whether the whether what kind of food is traded within those uh, those networks, and uh, and what are the values of the of the um, of the members or of the members of the of the uh, of the food networks. I will refer to this table later uh, later on. Uh, so so the research. Uh, so the, uh, the 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 research done in Western countries or America uh, shows uh, shows that there is uh, the alternative food networks are mostly white uh, and uh, created or sustained by the by the members of uh, middle or mid or upper middle class understood in a financial uh, financial uh, uh, through the through the through the income but also uh, through the uh, through their uh, uh, through their cultural capital 
Uh, the other source of exclusion in, in mentioned in le literature, there's unclear links to the concept of re regional uh, development. And also what is maybe, maybe this is actually the, the, the key issue, is that the, um, the food act as, uh, as, uh, e as an amplifier of cultural models and divisions related to them. The food and and it's and it's getting like this issue. I think is getting stronger and stronger. The food encoded symbolic field contains division with respect to ethnicity, gender, and uh, and, uh, and 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 other and other uh, and other is issues. Uh, this class division become particularly visible within the new nutritional trends. There is an increasing gap between the middle classes who know what to eat and can afford it, uh, and the lower class who also know what to eat but have neither the economic means nor the organizational capacity to satisfy uh, these needs. A good diet translates in a sense of control and uh, subject subjectivity. So this is a general um, source of the exclusion. Uh, uh, we, uh, we have established based on the re re literature. Uh, the specific sources of uh, exclusion, uh, so uh, the, 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 there, is, there might be many more, but I, we think that this is the two, 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 two key sources of exclusion. This is the class distinction uh, of uh, uh, class distinction, uh, also especially analyzed through the eating habits and the uh, food choices, uh, social classes and their imaginaries. Uh, we believe uh, are still in the process of the development in Poland. The mm, the many representatives of recent middle uh, class are the first city-born generations whose roots are stirring the countryside. Their class-based consumptions uh, are created on uh, on the meeting two two different factors. One is the 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 the, the rural uh, roots. On the other hand, the possibilities to travel, to travel, to 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 to, to and and to, uh, to 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 utilize the 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 and what they they see in the in the media, and and on the other hand, there and uh, there is also poor class, poor class. Um, they are characterized. The key issue I, we, we would think here worth mentioning is the practice practicality. Uh, there is expectation and the need. To, to live simple and uh, simplest way possible, uh, generating minimum uh, waste. They are aware how to what what is good uh, what it means good diet, but they are not able to fulfill their uh, th their diet. And they still um, the, the four class has a me the, the memory of the of the shortage e economy is still might we can say maybe but might be more vivid within this uh, this class. The, the second or the third uh, sources of the exclusions are the, uh, related to the uh, rapture of uh, rural urban rapture of Polish society. Uh, so we have uh, made a research uh, in 2019. Thanks God, before the pandemic, we managed to do the, the, the research. We did the six case uh, qualitative case studies. Uh, based on four factors uh, purpose sampling, uh, which refers part in, in to, to our division of the alternative food networks, uh, the, where the leader of the of the of the alternative food networks come from, what is the socioeconomic class of main actors, motivation for creation, and uh, if consumers and producer has to engage a lot. Uh, of their time and energy uh, to, to, to create it. So we picked uh, um, one, one farmer's market uh, in the central Poland, uh, family allotment, which we, we think is quite, uh, quite characteristic uh, network uh, for the eastern, central and eastern, uh, eastern Europe. Uh, however, now very popular as but not exactly the same, but similar to, to city gardening. 
Um, we, cho we, cho we have chosen one local action group uh, in the south of Poland uh, one, and two cooperatives. One very new cooperative, then was very new cooperative from the very north of Poland, and uh, and we and and very and on another very radical um, cooperative in Warsaw. Uh, the, which is which which has already quite long tradition, and the last case, our case study was the wine uh, Małopolski Przełom Doliny Wisły Wine Growers uh, Aso uh, Association. Uh, so I think we have chosen quite uh, uh, quite different case studies. Uh, however, we believe that we, we have tried to cover the uh, the the very very different types of alternative food networks. Alternative, uh, we meant those food networks, uh, formal or informal, also existing as formal or informal. However, it wasn't easy to find informal food network. Uh, that exists on the fringe of the main food system uh, uh, and is in somehow embedded in a, in a local uh, in a local uh, in a local uh, context that were the i think the the key the definitions of what is alternative for the, for all those uh, six uh, cases so uh, what is the the, the class exclusion. The, who are the producers uh, involved within the alternative food, uh, within our our food networks? The wine association was the um, the was extreme in a sense that it was created around luxury product, and the, those who produce wine within the within the within the s s food network are mostly in new incomers, very wealthy people uh, who we have uh, uh, called upper middle class uh, who uh, who produce wine less for the for the for the profit more for the for for uh, for fun however it takes a lot of time and a, a lot of money and knowledge uh, to to run uh, to run a wine a winery in Poland here as the some, some quotations from from our interviews uh, buying the plot i was thinking what i would be doing in the future after i have retired i find it a good way to remain active in some fields i keep investing there are some revenues but i spend more than i earn it's a lot of money really and uh, the people we, we talked with were able to were able to invest this uh, this this uh, money in wine uh, association, there are just very few uh, farmers, those who are uh, old, old inhabitants of this of this of this region, and they are clearly less uh, less wealthy, and also have they have less uh, they have less knowledge. So they we can say that the cultural capital or uh, is lower comparing to those new incomers. Also, in the case of farmers market, which used to be farmers market used to be in our region, very popular and very common way of providing quality food. Now they became much more fancy, much more, much more, also much more directed to the to the wealthier people. However, not as wealthy as the wine as those from wine associations and the uh, uh, farmers uh, and food producers involved in most of the alternative food networks we analyzed realized that their products must have higher price uh, compared to the conventional alternatives uh, which is justified with the manual often manual ma manufacturing methods and high quality source of product however the high price of the product is also a deliberate strategy to limit access to them uh, to a group of consumers who are aware that these products are unique and that the manufacture is expensive. Uh, this is the, I would say, most radical, uh, most radical um, alternative food networks, uh, food, co uh, food cooperatives. And the previous research done uh, on uh, 
farmers cooperating with alternative food networks show uh, that uh, that there are two kinds of far uh, farmers one one born in rural areas and continue the farming tradition however they have a usually small uh, small plots rel relatively small uh, plots and they are also the newcomers Mm, who have no rural background, sometimes com sometimes completely no rural background and no uh, education in the direction of farming, but have decided to move uh, to the countryside uh, and living from agriculture. Representatives of both groups have joined initiatives uh, seeking new sources of income. However, those born in rural areas, income was the primary motivation, while for the for newcomers, it was a secondary aspect. Uh, this is one uh, one of the farmers we talked with in alternative food networks. He said uh, he was a goat cheese product. Pro he, he produced goat cheese. I would like to change the world. I'm not doing this to earn money. If I wanted to earn money, I would certainly be doing something uh, else. This is a very well educated uh, person. Um, he moved. Uh, he moved from. A big city to a very uh, very small uh, very small uh, small uh, small village. And, uh, so, but these are quite more or less typical alternative food networks for Western tradition for Western for Western countries. But we also have a we also uh, found we also choose to talk with and to include the the allo fam family allotments as one form of alternative food networks as they do produce food they don't usually don't sell it on the market however they trade it so this is the also very informal uh, food uh, food uh, uh, food network uh, and this is a very distinct social group mm, they are typically older retired people mostly born in rural areas who bought or otherwise acquired a small plot um, a piece of land from the from the workplace before Poland's political transformation. Allotments are not just a place of food production, uh, but uh, but also or maybe maybe um, this is the first of our motivations way of spending way of spending time and creating some form of network. Uh, many older allotments holder, uh, they, we can call them uh, members of fall class. This is a usually uh, quite uh, quite poor people, not very well educated. Mm, they they mm, they are they are um, they hold ha some habits typical of the working class in the during the time of shortage economy. Uh, they are very creative in reusing the same product and not wasting any any food. On these pictures, we can see how they make how the how the how the how the houses cottage houses uh, are made using left uh, some uh, some uh, some uh, some leftovers. Interestingly, now there is a big uh, issue of being less less waste and so on they, they they this is what they have from the proper i think from the time of shortage economy and also from the place place of birth it was usually just after the second world war poor uh, rural areas so the allotment owners uh, we can say are both producers and uh, and uh, consumers However, some of the farmers uh, allotments owners we talked with were also selling a little bit of the products on the on the market in, in an illegal way. Who are the consumers? Uh, as I said, wine allotments and uh, wine association and allotments are two extreme examples. One upper middle class and the other is folk class. Uh, but the rest, but the rest, uh, rest of the members are um, are probably we can say that they are mem members of the middle middle class. Uh, um, in game, uh, because it's not only about money, it's not only just a matter of money, it's of course a matter of money, but sometimes it's, ma it's also a matter of choice and sacrifice some sac sac sacrificing something. Uh, choice whether to buy better food or something else. 
uh, but engagement in the alternative food networks require also in the term of consumption, not only production, uh, requires more work. There is a great, greater dedication and more time invested in food provisioning, uh, buying local food, planning what to cook, cooking from scratch, uh, using uh, season products and so on. Like in uh, conventional networks, this burden is uh, usually typically falls on the falls to women, and this is the same. The research from Western countries show the same uh, as in as in our case. So in our case, uh, uh, in our, in our case, it means that there is just a not very large group of women who are able to, to have a material material capital and also capital of time uh, to utilize for for selling for for, for for being a member of alternative food networks. So uh, so they are very often representatives of the. Uh, Middle class, however, uh, cre creative uh, crea group of crea crea creative people. Uh, cultural capital is also another instrument that distinguish alternative food networks consumers and producers, uh, visible in their growing awareness of environmental problems, method of production, and ethical issues related to food. Both producers and consumers highlight that they are very sensitive about the issue of all those issues. Uh, awareness is the term that almost every, any person we talked with has used. Uh, one, they they say that they 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 have the one who has to be careful with the nature and help that they care about nature and health, and and also they 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 mentioned a lot of times su certain sacrifices sacrifices in the matter in, when it comes to money, but also sacrifices when it comes to the way of life. The, the, the way of life or way of the pro way of production when it comes to the, uh, to, the to the to the production. Uh, here is the quotation that uh, showing that there is sometimes it goes too far. I mean that the people are just too, a little bit too uh, they be become a, a too extreme in the expectation. Uh, and one of the our farmers said, "My bread, my bread is the sort of bread and yeast bread, but it's uh, just a pinch of yeast for four leaves." Uh, laughs. Such bread grows faster and it's not that heavy, and people like it. But there's one lady who told it, I'm killing people with these. So th th this this notion that some people, this idea that some people are just too radical in the in the in their I, I, in the fulfilling the ideal uh, goals are going, I mean, to, going uh, too far. Uh, uh, there is, as I said, there is another way, um, I, uh, method of the distinction here. I will just focus very briefly. It's um, a special, a spatial exclusion and urban rupture in Polish alternative food networks. Uh, this is uh, um, food food production is still based on a well-established dichotomy, with the city seen as a place where food is consumed, consumed and the latter as a place where it is produced. It's a little bit cha challenge right now, but this challenge is not really very, it's, ju it's just the beginning, I think, the, the process of challenging it. And uh, uh, what is uh, interesting, it's that there are many, many issues appear here, but the few uh, that just I mentioned too, uh, that rural con consumers uh, very seldom appear in our study. Or uh, even if they operate in the countryside, even if the alternative food networks operate in the countryside, uh, those networks are oriented toward urban consumers. Here is the quotation from local action group. Uh, about the one of the local action groups. Uh, it is theirs owned by a group of people who work to establish the incubator. This is a fundamental issue. It is a paradox that incubator remains within the reach of both the monastery and the center, but it's still little known and among local residents. I don't know if this is some kind of propaganda. The information flow is somehow blocked or is something is wrong. And this issue uh, that the rural uh, consumers are very seldom uh, appear in our in our uh, in our re research. Uh, there is also uh, we, we found that the, the rurality is very often idealized. 
uh, and the alternative food networks through constructing the food in special way uh, contribute to the stereotypical image of ide idealical rural life. Uh, uh, which is which which doesn't exist. Yes, to 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 an idea of the of the great quality of the great quality of the the past of the memories of many of uh, of of uh, many people. So coming to the conclusions, there are two uh, mechanisms generating exclusion. One is everyday practices of consumers and producer, and the second is the symbolic imaginary of 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 the networks uh, acquire acquiring high quality food requires time uh, knowledge financial resources uh, which are often dictated by a person's social status uh, but also the 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 issue of symbolic refers to um, to, to 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 some kind of uh, emotions, yes, what if someone has the means to obtain organic food from a farmer's market, but they still feel that they do not fit in. Uh, alternative food networks are not socially neutral, rather they fit into the social imaginaries of specific dominant uh, social classes. Uh, this applies prim primarily to the dominant position of the large city, middle and upper middle class, Otherwise, rather hermetic and elitist networks such as the Association of White Mark Makers, uh, Winemakers, Purchase Group, or Consumer Cooperative. In this sense, Polish alternative food networks confirm the universal trajectory, creating a consumption space for those who have the means and resources to engage in such networks. In contrast, those networks, here in our example, is just allotments and in, to some extent farmers market, but mostly allotments, uh, networks embedded in the local context uh, seem to stand out as a class tension, plays a lesser role, with the exclusions taking place as a result of the conservative social imaginary cultivated by the members of these networks. So, uh, so uh, in, the in the case of the of the allotments, we can see uh, as the allotments are very more specific, more, more sp specific to our region, the, 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 those exclusions are especially primary uh, specific for, for our part of, of our Europe, of our of, of Europe. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you very much. much. Could you switch your, your microphone? OK, thank you very much. Um, uh, now it's turn to have questions or comments to uh, what just uh, Dr. Spiewak said. I see already a hand from Jan Dauwe van der Plek. Jan, are you decided to, to put your question? Jan? OK, that's uh, OK, uh, guys. So is there any other person? Um, uh, ready to ask a question or make a comment or give any kind of reaction to what just was said in this very interesting and uh, very, I would say, colorful uh, uh, presentation of, of alternative food networks in, in Poland. Okay, guys, the floor is yours. Go ahead. I see some people from Torun here, and I know that there are some research on food networks in Torun as well. But anyway, um, okay. So let let please think about your questions or comments. And I have um, a, a kind of the more general question, um, quite similar to what I just asked uh, uh, Professor uh, Matysiak before. Um, I'm really interesting uh, today in in uh, sustainable development. So that's that's kind of the focus of, of my uh, research now and my analysis and now. So um, I have the kind of the general question uh, to Dr. Spiewak. How do you evaluate the role of such phenomena like this 
food networks, alternative food networks analyzed in your research uh, and in your presentation, um, how would you evaluate their potential to, to the issues of, of sustainable rural development? Is it, well, is it like that any type of alternative food network has a kind of the positive effect on in this process or it should be more specified and there are some um, uh, alternative food networks that are not so for uh, 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 sustainable development. What, what is your opinion as the researcher focused on alternative food networks? Could you react, please? Well, I wonder uh, very often I ask myself and there's uh, also just some uh, some research done especially in France on how to, uh, how, how 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 it works and in other in in France for example it is the, the, the these networks have a means uh, have a ways already your power to to influence the dominant food net food system However, in Poland, uh, I think the process is very slow, but we have to remember that the European Union has uh, uh, has accepted the farm to fork uh, documents, uh, which are support which are supporting very much the idea of shortening food networks and uh, bringing closer consumer to producers. So we can assume that uh, those networks. Uh, will gain uh, will gain in power uh, in uh, in near future uh, in Poland as well. However, I have a doubt. Uh, some doubts also about it, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the idea of food cit food citizenship. Uh, I have doubts that the, that the alternative food networks are based on uh, some kind of uh, civic engagement or so so social engagement, and as we all know very well, that the social engagement uh, within Polish society is uh, is is quite uh, is quite weak. So I want I I ask myself. If we, if we have enough power, uh, if the the communities are, sh if we have a, if we as a society have a strong enough power or enough um, capacities to, to create those networks to be uh, sustain to be real, really sustainable uh, and efficient in providing food. However, the the idea of alternative food networks, some some concepts of the food networks, for example, embeddedness in the local context. Uh, is 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 gaining um, is gaining uh, popularity. For example, some uh, food big food chains like uh, Lidl are very uh, are doing very often uh, the week of the local products. So we can see that some of the notions uh, that were brought uh, that that are raised by the by the alternative food networks uh, like cross the border between alternative and conventional networks and uh, and and th th this is the proof that these ideas are are quite uh, uh, quite they they appear in the in the in the in the discourse of course there's a question if the Lidl sells the local food net food uh, is it still alternative or not does it good that it does it do good for, to, to the idea of sustainability, or or rather not. This is the, the this is the the, uh, the other the other other issue. But so my main concern is whether the Polish society uh, is uh, civic enough or has enough social capital and enough social means to to, to establish a real uh, food uh, real alternative food networks. As we know from many research, it's nothing new that especially on farm farmers have a quite low level of uh, of social capital so the question of cooperation is always uh, a, a tricky a tricky one okay uh, many thanks uh, ruta for your reaction and uh, i see uh, wojtek niech from torun i see your hand wojtek go ahead yeah thank you very much Krzysztof. thank you ruta for this very interesting speech and the the topic you chosen is really very inspiring for me, for us, for my team. Uh, as Krzysztof Golach mentioned, uh, we are we, we deal with this issue of alternative food networks as well. Uh, 
just one one remark, uh, and I would like you to comment this. Isn't it so that alternative food networks are exclusive in it? They are exclusive in their nature. I mean, they gather people. The, the idea is to gather people who claim for or they want very exclusive goods, extraordinary goods. So the nature of alternative food networks is that they are exclusive. So it means that they, by its nature, they will create a kind of uh, exclusions. And I like the idea of gastrogentrification. Uh, as we all know, uh, the typical gentrification processes we observe in the cities, they create many dysfunctions, many social conflicts, because they create problems, social problems, such as, for example, uh, a rapid increase of flood prices. Isn't it so that uh, alternative food networks described by you as examples of gastrogentrification, they causes the same problems? What do you think, Ruta? Uh, Once again, thank you for this very interesting speech, really. Mm. Okay. Ruta, Ruta, just a second, because I see another person, Alexandra Wagner from Krakow, wants to make a comment or ask a question. So please take her uh, reaction, and later you will react to both to Wojtek and Alexandra. Alexandra, go ahead. My question, thank you very much, and sorry again for not having a video, uh, but my camera doesn't work today. But um, my question, or um, maybe asking you, um, you for a comment, is somehow related with the previous one. But first of all, I would like to thank you for very, I also think it was very inspiring and very interesting and rich in third presentation. My question is about the uh, wine. Um, wine networks or winemakers in Poland, because uh, for me it is especially interest, interesting when I see uh, the wine market in Krakow, which is a demanding market, yes, and especially for the wine, for the Polish producer, uh, because in Poland we drink mainly the Italian wines and uh, maybe also the French and the Austria is quite popular. In some uh, groups uh, also the wines from uh, Moravia, the natural one, uh, the, the natural ones, but uh, I observed that for the last years uh, the Polish winemakers were strongly promoted in uh, social media, in some kind of uh, bubbles, information bubbles among yeah. the bloggers and people who are interested in a uh, in winemaking and uh, when we participated in, in some kind of niche degustation there um, it was in a good manner to have at least one Polish uh, wine on the table and uh, we could observe how this um, sometimes very good but very often very expensive wines over 150 zlotys per bottle um, were promoted. Not very good. <laughs> And uh, yes, of course, they are also more, more expensive, but um, I mean that 150 zlotys for a bottle is um, the price that you can buy, uh, I don't know, Chablis, yes, which is uh, much, much more recognizable. But, um, but um, what, I, um, what I would like to conclude, um, during the last few months, I could observe in the same social media uh, some kind of critics on the Polish winemakers and people say they start to be arrogant. They believe they are better than uh, our neighbors, than the people, winemakers from Austria or from Moravia. And they, uh, they forget that they should learn because it is quite a um, new tradition in Poland. Yes, and uh, even if the wine are good, maybe not as good as they, or maybe the position is not as good as they believe. And I wonder if it could cause the changes in perception of the Polish wine. And my question is regarding to the elite, elite, elitist, elitistic character of, the, um, of this kind of network. Do you think that uh, they are especially vulnerable to the um, to the small but powerful discourses in uh, the niche of consumers. So uh, if, if you would like to comment it somehow, it would be very interesting for me. Thank you very much. 
Okay, Ruta, so please react to both uh, questions and comments from Wojtek and uh, Ola. Go ahead. Wow, this is this can great questions. They can be beginning of a very interesting discussion. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree that uh, that within the nature of, uh, of alternative food networks, there is some form of exclusion embedded. And however, I see that there's two contradictions. Yes, on one hand, uh, the alternative food networks were created to provide the quality food uh, uh, not, less for profit, more for the for the idea of providing good food and providing a decent income for for farmers. Uh, uh, so, uh, but but uh, but on the other hand, yes, this is uh, you. Of course, that there are some exclusions, but there, there might be different form of exclusions. Yes, like in case of the uh, a lot owners of the allotments just requires. Uh, more time and specific knowledge to be able to be a, a allotment uh, food producer uh, while in case of other uh, alternative food networks it, 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 it requires much more it requires knowledge time money uh, which is which is seldom rarely combination uh, and yes you uh, I'm, I'm not sure if i'm really answering your, your question but i'm i'm, I'm not sure uh, but uh, Yes, and then this case of gastro uh, gastrification and um, again moving, I mean people ri rising the prices. It's exactly what I what I see on the on the farmers market. Yeah, they used to be uh, very common, very popular uh, during the communism, especially, and now. Uh, and now they become the place of exclusion. Yes, I, I rarely go to farmers market. I know it's very, it's not, the, 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 this is a, this is very became very elitistic, um, elitistic place. Selling this not really something very special. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Ah. And uh, I don't. I have the. I have a. Um, it was really interesting to see those wine winemakers association to see the the group of uh, really small group of people who who have knowledge, time, and money to invest in in wine, uh, pro, pro wine producing. It's interesting that uh, this location uh, we have chosen uh, for a reason because it used to be a place where the wine was produced, and it uh, it used to be even produced in the late twenties. Uh, but especially in the in the Middle Ages, so they were re they were reintroducing the the wine produ production, uh, but of course using the new uh, new uh, uh, new methods, and this is. Um, and as I said, this is I, I they, they say they, they don't do it for, for 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 money. They do it more for kind of entertainment. Uh, but let's say the, the the Polish wine is uh, is expensive, and I can understand that why the situ the, the 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 economical situation overall is getting worse. People will not spend more money on on worse uh, on on a, uh, on wine which they don't know uh, which they don't know very well. It's still a very uh, very elite very elite very elitistic product, and I, I assume it will. It will it will last us uh, at least until the further climate changes appear. It will last as a climate as a as a very elitistic uh, mm, product. And yes, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I really answered uh, answered uh, your question. But this is a, this is a, this is a, this is a really niche. Of, uh, this is a niche. Yes, the wine Polish wine producers. Uh, especially, uh, and uh, especially, at least those people we we, we talked with, they have uh, uh, they have means and don't need to earn money on that. At, at least in long, in short run, and short run. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. I um, well, we will see in the future. Yes, I really wonder how stable is this uh, this part of uh, of the alternative food networks, and if they will be stable or rather disappeared in some time because uh, of being criticized, for example, by the by the the consumers uh, themselves. Thank you. 
Th those who produce wine, they say that they will probably last as the climate changes and the, cl the weather gets warmer and warmer and, the, for example, the, the Sicily will not be able to produce wine anymore. So the market for Polish wine will rather, will probably grow not to due to the quality of the wine, but due to the luck that there will be less places for, for wine production in the Europe at least, but probably in the world. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, many thanks. Okay, we have still more or less 10 minutes to discuss Dr. Spiewak's uh, presentation and the results of her research. So I still see the hand of Jan Daube van der Plech. Jan, would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Jan, hello. Uh, okay, uh, if not, okay, um, we, we save uh, this 10 minutes maybe for the more general conclusions at the very end of our workshop for today. Thank you, Dr. Spiewak. Thank you, Ruta, once again for your um, uh, very impressive presentation and, and very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, now um, I, I see that we have uh, Professor Patrick Mooney among us. Uh, so, um, um, uh, as, you, as you know, we started our workshop today um, in the morning with the presentation by the uh, international um, rural sociologist Jan Daube van der Plech, who prepared the kind of the foreword to our volume based on the uh, results of our research. Um, and um, Patrick Mooney um, is a kind of the uh, person who prepared the afterword. Uh, so we, we, the last presentation um, uh, during our workshop will be uh, made by, by the author of the afterword to the volume. But before I will give the floor to Patrick, I want to say a few words about him. Um, Patrick is a professor of sociology at the University of Kentucky uh, in Lexington in the United States, where he has worked since 19... 85. Though he is native of rural Illinois, um, he received his MA in sociology from the University of Northern Iowa in uh, 1977 and uh, uh, his PhD from the University of Wisconsin Madison in 1985. He has held visiting faculty positions here in Krakow at Jagiellonian University, but also at the University of Calabria in Consensa in Italy, as well as the Kyoto University in Kyoto, Japan. So he is another international or a global uh, academic person uh, among uh, us. His research has included work in rural sociology, the sociology of agriculture, rural stratification, social movements, agricultural cooperatives, and food security issues. And he has recently initiated this is very interesting research on the relationship between religion and environmentalism, with particular interest in the role that religions may play in the possibilities for a more sustainable agriculture and planet. And let me also um, add a very personal remark. Uh, uh, we met for the first time with Patrick Mooney in 1987 in Lahti, Finland. So it's more, much more than 30 years of our cooperation and of our friendship. I, I'm really glad that um, you are among us and you will give us uh, your presentation as the uh, final one in our workshop. So, Pat, the floor is yours now. Go ahead. Um, can you hear me all right? Let's yes. Let's do the sound yes. check and you can yes. see me? Yes. Okay, and let me uh, make sure I can share. I went through, thank you to Olga for helping me prepare for this yesterday. Um, I think, where's the share thing? Um, I wanna share my screen. Um, 
full screen up. Uh, oh, here, share content. Um, do you see my screen now? Yes, yes. OK. Then yes, I think go ahead. Have, great. Um, OK, well, uh, good morning from Lexington, Kentucky. Um, uh, I uh, wish I would have been able to join from the very beginning, but uh, that was about four o'clock this morning. So, um, and I also wish we could all be together in beautiful Krakow. Um, it's a lovely city, and I have great uh, memories of my time there with uh, Shristoff and Piotr, and so forth. Um, all my friends. Um, it's been quite a year on this planet. Um, as a senior citizen, I in this country, I feel kind of like a survivor. Um, honestly, uh, I haven't uh, been able to, for the last year, been able to read or think uh, much on these matters other than reviewing a draft of uh, this manuscript. Um, I've my the pandemic has just eaten up my teaching, uh, teaching online, and um, and I don't teach in the area of agriculture or rural sociology. So uh, this is a chance for me to uh, think again uh, about some of these uh, matters. And um, I'm hoping that over the next uh, nine months, I have sabbatical next year, I'm hoping to be able to pursue some of these um, matters again. <clears throat> Uh, some of my remarks will follow from uh, some of the thoughts I, I shared uh, in the afterward uh, to uh, to this wonderful book uh, that the Yagalonian team has uh, put together. Um, I'll share some additional thoughts and comments about where this project might go from here. Um, I hope to elevate along those lines the aspirations of this book to um, as Shishtoff says, uh, bring farmers back in. Uh, I'll briefly consider how the prior sociology of agriculture let farmers disappear um, uh, in, in hope that we can keep them in view in the next iteration of the sociology of agriculture. That next sociology of agriculture, I'm not sure if it's 2.0 or 3.0 or 4.0, uh, but it is of course emerging in a different world it's emerging in a different disciplinary environment, and we need to consider all of that. Finally, I may offer some concluding thoughts that will entertain some possible new interface of the sociology of agriculture with some broad influences of the sociology of religion. But this is really kind of embryonic work for me at this point, um, but especially about the need to sort of revalue the meaning of our relationship to the farm, to the farmer, to the land, to the work, to the food. Um, to some extent, I think maybe some of these values have been uh, latent, especially in the activist side of this, um, uh, where we can uh, find some of this. Um, and of course, that activist, uh, in the United States anyway, that activist impulse, I think, was part of the initiation of bringing farmers back in the last time rural sociology uh, went through this. So um, if I end up offering more questions and answers, uh, I hope that will be taken as an indication of the success of this book uh, rather than any sort of inadequacy. Uh, surely the spirit of my discussion will be a hope that this team's work will inspire a new generation of work uh, in the sociology of agriculture. When I refer to this project, I'm referring to two aspects uh, of the publication uh, around which we're gathered to ce celebrate uh, uh, today. Uh, first is just a tremendous effort to document the present conditions of Polish agriculture. Um, uh, following that um, aspect of the project is a hope that this document might provide a point of departure for both more detailed uh, qualitative analysis as well as more uh, comparative an analysis of European agriculture, uh, perhaps especially of the agricultures of Eastern and Central Europe, and further documentation of the sociological implications of the relationships between the national agricultures as they're modified by each nation's policy, by European Union policy, and 
by global dynamics. Secondly, I'm referring to the author's interests in revitalizing a sociology of agriculture. Christoph talks in the introductory chapters of, uh, about bringing farmers back in, uh, farmers having been marginalized even from rural sociology, uh, surprisingly. Um, and I will try to focus on that uh, uh, latter concern. First, let me take the present work uh, that we're celebrating today as a point of departure for that broader project. Um, and again, my familiarity with the sociology of agriculture is uh, apologetically um, heavily U.S.-based, although uh, I do have some familiarity with the Polish situation given my long standing relationship with Krzysztof Piotr Anna and my other Polish friends across the country. Um, the present work, um, again, is the most sweeping sociological documentation of a modern nation's agriculture with which I'm familiar. Um, it's well grounded in an historical perspective, uh, yet I want to say that it's not definitive. Um, uh, I hope and expect that the work will provoke, provoke, as I said, more detailed investigation of these findings with respect to some of the issues that are, are raised. Um, many of the issues raised and addressed in the book, I think, uh, evolved, uh, it seems, perhaps on the margins uh, of a prior sociology of agriculture. Uh, and um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, they evolved on the margins of a prior sociology of agriculture and deserve this kind of attention that they've received uh, here. Bringing a lot of these issues to the center is an important accomplishment of this book. Some examples, um, the, the role of women in agriculture, and more generally, perhaps the examination of gendered relationships, I think, uh, needs to um, uh, have more attention uh, in the soci in the is next sociology uh, of agriculture, both the gendered relationships within uh, families and also within communities. Uh, recently in uh, the Journal of uh, Society and Natural Resources and in Rural Sociology, there's been some work on queer farming. Uh, this raises even more provocative aspects about bringing farmers back in, uh, perhaps especially uh, with respect to the complex gendered social relationships that complicate the, quote, family farm um, uh, and, and issues that this has with respect to the nature of the farming and particularly around legal relationships, ownership issues, inheritance issues, health care issues, and so forth. Uh, the book also recognizes the importance bifurcation aspect. Uh, we heard a little bit of, about this in the uh, in the last uh, presentation. Um, uh, this success in the United States, anyway, of this alternative farming, organic agriculture, direct marketing, community supported agriculture, seems to me uh, to have left us with a bifurcation on the agriculture side uh, that's uh, almost sometimes seems like two systems. Uh, one of a large so-called industrial agriculture producing food for mass consumption, the so-called food from nowhere, uh, and a smaller farm-based commercial sector that produces for niche markets of affluent consumers, also known as the food from somewhere. Uh, the relationship between this emergent sector of agriculture um, which is perhaps one that many envisioned in the first, um, uh, as a hope anyway, in the first sociology of agriculture. Um, but this emergent sector uh, may play a role, as we just heard, in the reproduction of inequalities in food consumption beyond the farm. Um, uh, specifically, we might say that the latter is food for someone, uh, and uh, the former is food for no one in particular. I like the question raised about the, quote, good farm. Uh, for too long, it seems to me, uh, the rest of us, especially perhaps again in the United States, have allowed the economists uh, to dictate the centrality of purely economic considerations in this matter, externalizing all sorts of other values, benefits, um, and costs. 
this has consequences. Uh, uh, the ears of politicians uh, are often attuned to these analyses uh, more than they are to issues of social or moral uh, economy. I think Jan van der Ploeg, um, uh, of course, has done great work in bringing these matters uh, to the table. Uh, and this present work being influenced uh, to some extent by his work, I think also subsequent uh, su asserts the validity and the seriousness of these other uh, values. Uh, some uh, further investigations uh, following from this might um, uh, be best uh, developed from a more qualitative uh, approach. Um, uh, I really like, um, if I say the name right, Milcharik's investigation of habitus and the field of culture. I think this is a very promising line uh, for further inquiry. Um, on this side of the Atlantic anyway, uh, the rural sociology has often pursued analysis of social capital, um, but has not often considered social capital in the context of its embeddedness in fields uh, or the role that habitus plays in structuring those fields. I think we need to recognize that you know, the original um, spirit of this social capital was that it interfaced with habitus uh, and particular fields. Um, uh, the, uh, I thought the chapter by Dombrovsky, Kotkevich, and Novak um, uh, really helped to point uh, some promise uh, for the direction in the direction of qualitative uh, approaches to the study of um, mechanization and digitalization um, uh, processes in agriculture. Uh, of course, many of these studies invite comparative analysis with other nations' uh, agricultures, especially uh, in the European Union. Um, uh, uh, some such investigations might reveal something more about the national or regional culture of agriculture uh, in relationship to the common elements of European Union policy and economy. I think, for example, of the, um, uh, I think uh, it was Christoph um, uh discussion of the class trajectory and the talk of variable use of European Union subsidies, um, whether to reinvest that in the farm or to put it toward a, a child's education, uh, presumably the latter uh, perhaps being a path away from farming. Uh, what does that look like in other European uh, nations? I think this is an interesting question. I've always been intrigued by the uh, issue in Poland of the, the meaning of hired labor um, in Polish agriculture and this kind of cultural resistance to selling agricultural labor. Uh, in the community. Uh, uh, the exchange of labor doesn't seem to be uh, so problematic as the hiring of labor. And I enjoyed this uh, discussion um, of the um, uh, of labor as a kind of manner of matter of honor. Um, it kind of goes to the heart of capitalist development. Um, and it seems the findings suggested, uh, a diminishing of this uh, cultural resistance that I think deserves more uh, examination from a qualitative approach and perhaps a more comparative uh, uh, kind of analysis of what, what's the cultural meaning of hired farm work in relationship to one's honor status and the distinction one has within rural communities. <clears throat> oh that note is that anything for me okay um and then of course the discussions of uh, sustainability uh, that uh, we find throughout the uh, uh, the text um uh, deserve uh, greater attention in more comparative uh, uh form um sustainability um in my terms would be one of those kinds of consensus framings um, that something that we can all agree on. Uh, uh, nobody is really for unsustainable agriculture uh, until we examine it a little bit more closely. And then we realize that the ownership of the idea of sustainability is important for, um, for most uh, actors in the uh, field, 
uh, whether they really um, uh, are pursuing a sustainable agriculture uh, or not. Um, for now, let me say, and I'm surely not the first to say this, that um, we might ask, uh, how can we have a sustainable farm without a sustainable community, without a sustainable region, nation, or planet? Um, if the sustainable, the sustainable farm, it would seem, must be nested in a broader sustainable place if the de facto interests of sustainability are to actually be achieved. I think the sustainable farm can reach outward toward the place in which it's embedded, but that larger place must also be nurturing the possibility of a sustainable farm. And then finally, there's also this interesting question and came up again in this last um, uh, discussion about the uh, relative weakness of Polish civil society and what does that mean for Polish uh, agricultural production and food consumption? Um, and, and what does that look like in comparison to other European uh, nations? I think this is also a fascinating uh, question. Um, so um, we've been here before. Um, uh, the first time uh, rural sociology brought farmers back in was at the beginning of my career. Um, and now it seems to be happening uh, at the end of my career. And I hope I'm not responsible for its demise in the meantime. Um, uh, in the United States, this first round of the sociology of agriculture, uh, the, uh, the new sociology of agriculture, uh, first was represented as a critical rural sociology in, the, uh, in a book uh, by Buttle and uh, Newby. Um, and, and perhaps, as I recall, the, um, the, the critical aspect of this was in some senses that agriculture was being brought back in to rural sociology. Um, prior to that, the treatment of agriculture by rural sociology could arguably be said to have constituted little more than marketing research uh, for uh, the, the commercial diffusion of innovations. This would seem to be the dominant interest in agriculture uh, through the 50s and 60s uh, in rural sociology. Uh, secondly, uh, that, um, uh, that new rural sociology was actually a new political economy, um, as the um, uh, book by Buttle, Larson, and Gillespie uh, discuss it. It was really a political economy of agriculture reflecting uh, Marxian roots. Uh, that interest, uh, that base, uh, I would say, um, uh, eventually would become quite theoretically and methodologically diverse uh, as the sociology of agriculture diffused again more thoroughly into rural sociology. Um, but in some ways that diffusion to the broader discipline perhaps began to lend to the erasure of the farmer. To some extent it, it opened the doors to the, the coincidental uh, uh, cultural shift that was taking place in the broader discipline. Uh, there was a tendency to focus perhaps more on the relations of consumption uh, than on the relations of uh, production. Um, I think there was also embedded in that political economic approach an ambitious agenda uh, around uh, uh, the role of the state and comparative commodity analysis uh, that lent to a kind of Tower of Babel <laughs> and a devolution to ever more micro level po concerns with policy, with the nature of commodities, uh, with non-farm uh, 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 relationships uh, uh, and so forth. Um, each commodity, uh, this commodity analysis approach, um, initially it was intended, I think, to grasp the whole of the system. Uh, we see here one version of this uh, model. Uh, it was intended to grasp the whole system, uh, uh, but uh, I think increasingly um, it began to focus uh, on 
the boxes rather than on uh, the arrows. Um, so what is it, if we re or to renew the sociology of agriculture, um, uh, what does it mean um, by a sociological view? Uh, from my perspective, often when I pick up uh, a study, a contemporary study, um, many that feel like a sociology of agriculture could well be written by anthropologists, by geographers, philosophers, perhaps sometimes even by an agricultural economist of an institutionalist persuasion. Um, for me, a sociology of agriculture will focus on social relationships between people, within groups, between groups, between people, groups, institutions. Um, it seems to me that at base, uh, the most elementary form of sociological work um, is a, a focus on relationships and interactions. Uh, not so much about actor A or actor B themselves as analyzing that arrow that connects them and then begin to ask what kinds of adjectives we can use to qualify those arrows are those what are those relationships constituted by are they competitive cooperative conflicting trusting so forth i think we might also take a lesson from w.e.b du bois uh, uh, his notion of the the veil is there a veil distorting those relationships a veil of power a veil of authority, of race, gender, class, disability, rur rurality in this case, perhaps. Um, in the United States, we talk about rural places as non-metro, um, uh, as if uh, they're not anything uh, in themselves, it's just that they're not metropolitan. What are the relationships within the farm, between the farm and other entities? Um, in that prior sociology of agriculture, in that commodity analysis approach, for instance, that wanted to examine uh, the whole uh, system, uh, it's only uh, here, this one uh, little box that we find the farmers and the producers, uh, it's no wonder the farmer got lost in all of this. And in some cases, the people got lost in all of this. Um, uh, for a while, I was a member of the, I was the Rural Sociological Society's representative to the Council on Agricultural Science and Technology. I was the only social scientist or was not even an agricultural economist on board. Um, uh, and I, this is in the, uh, this is more than a decade ago, but I, it was hard for the ag production scientists to accept, I think, that their hegemony in dictating food production was being eroded by the power of consumers and retailers. Every now and then the discussion would get around to the fact that people produce food, that people consume food, and they'd turn to me um, as the only social scientist and say, um, and sort of uh, give me the leftovers, uh, the issue of farmers and consumers uh, in agriculture. So to some extent, people in general, I think, got lost in some of this. Um, the the Relationships that the prior sociology of agriculture emphasized were those of the family. Uh, and surely uh, uh, the public discourse hung heavily on this uh, term, the, the family uh, farm. Uh, that opens the door, I think, to a relational sociology. Uh, but I do think that the next sociology of agriculture needs to be prepared to problematize the concept of family recognizing, uh, uh, as the discipline has, a greater diversity uh, than a family than generally appears in the popular imagination of family and of family farm. Uh, so here again, we return to the question of work uh, in the relationships. Um, then we can subsequently investigate the substantive diversity of such households. I think, again, Jan's uh, conceptual scheme uh, about the family farm functions well to keep this door wide open uh, and avoids 
possible exclusions um, in many ways of what we might say are uh, atypical families by focusing on autonomy, self-employment, uh, the domus or the household, the, the history of, uh, the, of the farm, the continuous skill development, membership in the community, co-production of the landscape. I think all of these um, uh, allow us to recognize a more diverse uh, notion of, uh, of um, family. Um, I'd say the next uh, sociology of agriculture um, uh, may need to, may be permitted uh, to be a more public sociology related to the family farming uh, uh, or the autonomous uh, household. Um, uh, this uh, agenda uh, of, uh, has perhaps been somewhat obscured by scientific, I don't know if I want to call it pretenses, but maybe some of us need to go straight up. It seems we've been sometimes on the margins cheering uh, for the family farm um, and for autonomy and independence and skill development, um, uh, but hesitant sometimes to just say it. Um, uh, it's, it seems to me that this is no more a uh, violation of value freedom uh, than the hegemonic economistic worship at the altar of a free market that seeks to commodify everything from the seed to the dinner table. Uh, John Yan's uh, comments on the cover of the book seem to represent that kind of unabashed cheer for Poland's retention of uh, family farming. Uh, the American, uh, the late American sociologist uh, Tom Lysen's notion of civic uh, agriculture uh, had this same quality. But uh, many of us, the rural sociologists, seem to be pulling uh, for the family farm, but sometimes it seems to be uh, in the closet. Um, in vis a vis the politics, um, most states uh, recognize that this family farm uh, also has considerable consensus value. It's a, uh, it's a uh, imaginary that uh, conjures up, is, the imaginary that it conjures up is valued uh, often by uh, the culture, but the idea tends to get tossed up there as often as a legitimating kind of cloaking device for policy uh, that almost always actually intentionally or unintentionally um, uh, subverts the claimed uh, objectives. We can think about the, uh, sometimes the bailouts of uh, farms, uh, family farmers and so forth uh, uh, are really bailouts of the banks or bailouts of the landlords. Uh, the farmer often providing a legitimate, a legitimate source of uh, kind of laundering the money en route to saving, uh, to saving the bank or the landlord uh, class. Um, Along those lines, this was never going to be simply an economic struggle or simply a political struggle, but also uh, a cultural struggle. And I think the Kentucky author, Wendell Berry, uh, early on began to uh, tell us that. Um, and then we can ask, um, uh, what is in in the new, in the next sociology of agriculture, what is agriculture? Um, what do we do with urban agriculture? This, I don't remember this being much of an issue the last time around. Uh, uh, is rural sociology, um, just as rural sociology abandoned agriculture, should the next sociology of agriculture now abandon rural sociology? What, what does urban agriculture look like? Um, what other changes have taken place? As I noted in my afterward, 25 years from now, um, we may not recognize agriculture as anything like what we now know it as. Um, the discussion in the text regarding mechanization and digitalization of agriculture, uh, along with the genetic engineering possibilities in the new future, um, uh, may uh, render today's agriculture as um, uh, as unrecognizable. And I may 
be able to raise this issue again in my concluding remarks. In, um, it, it seems to me that the prior sociology of agriculture was focused heavily on the mainstream of agriculture, um, born to some extent of that unsettling of agriculture that Barry uh, talked about in the mid 70s um, and the threats to that mainstream for uh, uh, part of that prior sociology of agriculture. Those threats were borne out in the United States with particular vengeance in the farm crisis of the early 1980s. Um, since that time, sociology, I think, um, uh, more, more broadly has paid more attention to what um, we might call the sociology of the margins, um, uh, the, ex the excluded, the peripheral. Uh, and I think the next sociology of agriculture should be attentive to those margins. Uh, not just uh, uh, before the mainstream is threatened with marginality, uh, but even after they've become uh, marginal. Um, and I think we can also agree that the attention to the margins can also tell, tell us a great deal about the mainstream and uh, the center. Um, at the moment, I, uh, as anecdotally here, um, I'm involved with a couple of dissertations uh, uh, by promising uh, young sociologists who are doing work in the sociology of agriculture. Uh, but in neither case was agriculture really the first interest. Um, one of my students, Kevin Alejandres, is uh, living and working um, among uh, in the fruit and vegetable producing uh, region of uh, uh, central Oregon. Um, uh, um, I asked him to tell me a little bit about, um, uh, in preparation for this, about why, um, given his interest in uh, Latinx culture, movement, politics, education, so forth, uh, why agriculture? And he wrote, if I may cite, um, I realized that agriculture has been a significant uh, part of my life. While I always separated my personal life from school life, I recognize that farm work is part of my family's and my community's story. Um, uh, his parents labored in the fields as kids, we did too. Um, some of them still work in agriculture. Many of us worked so hard to get an education to not end up in the same place as our parents, yet farm life seems to be an end goal for many of us. Not all my friends um, some of my friends uh, talk about wanting to own a small piece of land someday where they can farm. I find it interesting that we can work so hard to survive beyond the fields, only to feel desire to stay connected with agriculture itself. For many people I know, it's become part of our lives, even when we remove ourselves from it, it's become part of our culture. Uh, another student that I'm working with, uh, Alessandro Del Bracco, who's at an earlier stage in her work, is interested in uh, queer politics, queer culture, uh, and is interested in uh, queer farming um, um, and or queer farmers, maybe. Um, uh, she says, I became curious about why it seems like LGBTQIA plus people are often very involved in reconnecting themselves and their communities to food production, often through farming, specifically small scale sustainable farming and other methods of alternative agriculture. Um, are more are LGBTQIA plus people more invested in this work than their straight counterparts because of their experience uh, with other uh, types of marginalization. Uh, she's interested in uh, farming as a method of community building. And finally, um, uh, there's a group in the United States who studies uh, the agriculture of the middle. Um, uh, and yet this stimulating this interest in the agriculture of the middle uh, is the fact that the middle's disappearing. So are we presented here with the paradox that even the middle is marginal. Um, uh, these are some interesting uh, uh, questions, I think. Um, that 
that need to be part of the next uh, sociology of agriculture. Now, I have to say I might be arguing uh, against myself a little bit here. Um, uh, and so I might throw out a, a word of caution. Some of the, some, it seems that some of what I'm recommending to follow up to this project are the same stumbling block, blocks that led us away from farmers and farming in farming and farming in the last iteration of a sociology of agriculture. And I plead guilty in part. Uh, yet I don't know how we move forward without more detail, without more qualitative investigation, uh, and without more comparative analysis. What I can say at this point is that a renewed sociology of agriculture must keep an eye on the bigger picture uh, and not me miss seeing uh, the forest for the trees. Uh, the previous approach had a macro level approach, uh, consideration in the realm of global food regimes, um, which was often helpful, but was often at such a macroscopic level that it too perhaps further eclipsed the farmer. I'd make an argument for meso level theories of the middle that continue to recognize the farmer, but to link their farmers, their work, their culture to the broader economy and communities in which they live. How am I doing on time, Krzysztof? It's okay. Okay, so go ahead. We saved okay. more or less 10 minutes from the previous okay. presentation, so go oh, ahead. Okay. All right, this is, this is my uh, last uh, slide, and this is this uh, kind of uh, uh, new thing that I want to, um, uh, to throw out there and see what happens. And again, these are really um, tentative thoughts um, that I have not had a chance to explore. Um, uh, but in the past few years, uh, um, I've undertaken a, in a longstanding but latent interest in teaching and research in the sociology of religion. Um, as Krzysztof noted at the beginning, my interest has primarily been oriented toward the relationship between uh, religion and ecological considerations. There's been a movement in uh, uh, kind of an intellectual activist movement around this uh, relationship between uh, religion and ecology uh, that um, today is primarily centered at Yale, but it considers global, uh, many global uh, religions. Um, today, it's a joint venture of the Yale um, Divinity School and the Yale School of Environmental uh, Studies. Um, the, the, this literature is grounded heavily in the humanities, uh, but I'm beginning to think that some this literature has considerable potential for filling uh, some of the gaps uh, in our literature, especially around sustainability and family. Um, so briefly, what I might suggest is that we can learn something from uh, Peter Berger's influential notion of the sacred canopy um, and its more recent adaptation by the sociologists Roberts and Yamane. Um, here, let me be clear, I'm operating with a very elastic understanding of religion. Um, but this sacred canopy idea suggests that an integrated worldview and ethos uh, can be protected uh, by an interactive and complementary set of myths or beliefs, uh, rituals or practices, symbols and meanings uh, that can reinforce that worldview and that ethos. Um, can we learn something about the defense of peasant or family farm production here? Um, it seems that we recognize in the present work and others that there is surely a particular worldview and a particular ethos associated with family farming and peasant production. Uh, it seems that we're also continuously observing the assault on this worldview and this ethos from many social, economic, and political forces. Can we begin to ask what kinds of practices, what kinds of beliefs, uh, what kinds of uh, meanings and symbols can be mobilized uh, or are mobilized um, in further defense of that worldview, that ethos? Um, perhaps the most simple recognizable way into this is uh, articulated by um, uh, Norman Bergba um, in a, a book subtitled uh, A Theology of Eating, um, uh, Food and Faith. Uh, 
uh, he um, talks about saying grace, sim a simple ritual of uh, saying grace and how, um, uh, how many of us still continue to take a moment to uh, say a blessing or a thank you, uh, not necessarily to a god or a deity of some sort, but at least to the farmer for their work, uh, to consecrate the food that work, um, and especially if that farmer went out of the way to produce safe, healthy, nutritious food uh, for else. How else can we work to consecrate the work of the farmer? Um, all sorts of forces are working to desecrate that work. When we use the phrase, the popular meme, food for people, not, prof not for profit, we really are elevating uh, the use value of the food over its exchange value, um, uh, over that reduction of the work and the product to mere commodities, uh, rather than the nurturance of our bodies uh, and perhaps our souls. Uh, most new forms of mechanization, digitalization, only put more obstacles, I think, between the farmer and the nature with which farmers co-produce food. The rift grows, even on the farm. Uh, Lisa Sedaris, a professor of uh, theology at Indiana University, argues instead that it's the science that gets consecrated here. Uh, not the work, uh, not the food, but the science is what is consecrated, what is rendered sacred. Um, I'm only beginning to explore these matters. Um, I suppose the question for academics and activists here is how we can more explicitly develop rituals and practices, uh, tell stories that reinforce beliefs um, that so much of agriculture is actually a wonder, as the great Rachel Carson might have put it. Um, it could be the sort of wonder that is at the heart of, of the religious experience. Yet the bulk of forces out there are set at demystifying that experience, disenchanting, uh, in Weber's words, disenchanting that um, relationship of ours uh, with nature. Um, I think back to the matter from the book about the honor or dishonor of hired farm work. How is it? that the same labor, the same task, when undertaken under autonomous self-employment within a household of co-producers can be an honorable task when that same task, if paid, is dishonorable. Um, uh, so these are, again, some, some kinds of initial thoughts, I hope, uh, by uh, the end of this uh, sabbatical, I'll have more to say about that. Um, uh, but you can, these are, uh, the covers of a couple of books in, in this, uh, area that are beginning to talk about agriculture from this, uh, religious perspective, uh, um, Sabbath as resistance, um, uh, uh, sustainable agriculture from a Christian perspective. Uh, there's a number of, uh, of these beginning to, um, uh, find their way out, uh, into the into our world. So, um, in conclusion, then um, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this uh, um, uh, this wonderful book uh, that uh, this team has uh, put together. Um, I, I think it's just a, a, an incredible task that they set for themselves and followed through um, in a uh, in a really surprisingly disciplined and timely manner. I, I think um, they, it's just been a remarkable uh, to be able to follow along with uh, their work uh, in developing this uh, project. So uh, so thank you for the work uh, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, to discuss it. Dziękuję bardzo. Okay, um, many thanks, uh, Pat for your uh, tremendous presentations. And you opened, I think, so many ways uh, for further analysis and for further thoughts that it's almost impossible <laughs> to, to, um, to follow all of them. Well, that's, let's try to, 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 to follow at least some uh, issues that you raised in your presentation. Uh, okay, guys, uh, who wants to start our our um, uh, exchange of ideas? 
questions, remarks, discussion, we have still more or less than 20, 25 minutes for this. Uh, Pat, one again, yeah. Could, yeah. You, could you remove your, uh, your uh, oh, slide okay. from the screen? I think so. Uh, hmm. There's me, I'm gone. Um, how do I get back to... Oh, here we go. I'm I'm not I've not used Teams before. We're we're a Zoom uh, institution here. Uh, I don't want to leave. Uh, where? Oh, did I do that? Oh. Okay, many thanks. Is it gone? Okay. Yeah, many thanks. Okay. Thank you once again. And guys, mm -hmm. the floor is open. Who wants to start our um, discussion with questions, comments, reactions, uh, some further thoughts about the content of Pat's presentation? Go ahead. <clears throat> Do I see? Oh, yeah, Jan. Jan Dauer van der Plech. Go ahead, Jan. Uh, yes, here I go. At least I try to go. Um, okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Pat, for this uh, exciting contribution. Uh, uh, and it's interesting. Uh, we seem to be with more people uh, moving in the same uh, direction, although uh, we cannot yet say exactly what will be the contours of uh, uh, the new sociology, the new rural sociology, the new sociology of agriculture. Uh, there are commonalities and uh, as if there are secret threats that uh, unite us. Uh, rituals. Uh, I, I was uh, well. It's 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 indeed uh, the rituals. There still are many rituals. There is a ritual in the in the meetings of uh, farmers when they discuss together uh, the quality of uh, their animals. Well, they talk about the the nobility of cows. Uh, there is rituals in the uh, meetings of uh, Via Campesina when they do their. Uh, how they call it? Well, anyway, they start always with, with a kind of ritual. Uh, uh, there are, there are, but they are, and 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 farmers like to be together. Uh, one could even say that maybe some of the upheaval we witnessed here in Europe, uh, the the street manifestations, uh, farmers asking for respect, uh, <laughs> it's all very enigmatic. But it is it is looking for for recognition and, and trying to find this recognition beyond indeed the commodity relations and, 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 and the commodity markets. Uh, uh, anyway, what I, apart from uh, uh, saying this, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, what, what is your experience from the empirical realities you know? What are the cradles? What are the, 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 the breeding places uh, where uh, where the new rituals are uh, germinating, where they are being tried out, uh, passed to others. Uh, uh, maybe you can give us some, uh, well, some, some, shed some light on this issue. Thank you. Oh, let's see. Am I still on? Oh. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, Jan, Pat, would you like to react right now? Yeah, um, I wish I could react more uh, uh, strongly. Um, I, I agree that um, uh, that there are, um, I, I think, in the in the organizations that I've been associated with, there are um, uh, rituals uh, that do this. I'd be probably more familiar with um, uh, Catholic rural life 
uh, in the United States uh, has a tendency to, uh, uh, when I've been to some of their meetings, they have a tendency to ritualize this. I, I might be inclined to say that, um, that to some extent, some of what I'd call rituals, uh, what we might think of as rituals, are l are less reflexive. They're more latent as rituals. They're practices uh, that people have. Um, uh, but uh, they're in the... Um, there are rituals, uh, if I think about some of the other groups I've been around lately in some of the food policy councils, uh, there's often kind of, I don't mean to be too cynical, but kind of a ritualized profession of faith and confidence in uh, or belief in uh, food justice uh, and the, the right to food. Um, and, and in some ways, <laughs> I worry that it's only ritualized, uh, that that there's not a deeper understanding of what it might mean to actually implement a right to food and the what seems to me would be a full-on decommodification if we really took seriously the right to food. And, and so maybe, maybe my answer is that I need to pay more attention. I think it's a great question. I need to pay more attention to sort of excavate what some of those rituals are that might be a helpful way in for me um, to uh, to begin to uh, uh, access what it is the rituals that are already there the extent to which they're conscious rituals uh, or whether they're um, ritual rituals um, that people aren't <laughs> uh, Ritualized rituals, you know, I'm saying that they're not uh, fully cognizant, reflective of, well, I grew up Catholic, so I know all about ritualized rituals. Um, uh, so, uh, but that might, be a, that might be a really good way in uh, to begin to think about this. When I teach uh, more generally about the sociology of religion, this is a way in uh, for my students to get into this sacred canopy way, is to follow in through the ritual um, uh, and, um, and again, the, the saying grace is so much the, the, the clearest, um, version of this. That's a, that's a, that's a, not only a good question, but a good insight in terms of a strategy for, um, for entering into this as I, uh, as I go on. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Patrick. Yeah, that's great. Okay, uh, thank you, Patrick. And uh, who is next? Um, okay. Um, okay, I don't see uh, more uh, more uh, hands. But well, just in the meantime, let me let me just uh, I don't know. Let's formulate it one question and one one uh, remark. Uh, the, the, the first, the question that's that's uh, and it's it's uh, to you, but well, that's that's um, a, I don't know exactly. Uh, that's that's how do you consider the role of of religion in in uh, farming in farming practices? Um, but but it seems to me that's what and what I observe here in Poland that. That um, the religion might might be the basis for very different practices and attitudes toward nature, toward animals, toward of type of farming or style of farming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For example, there is one side of this of this uh, discussion. Uh, and the people say, well, that's that's we have to use the natural resources. Uh, we might kill the animals and eat them, uh, okay? Because the God gave us uh, this uh, superpower position uh, on the earth. The, the God gave it to humans the superpower position. And on the other hand. And on the other hand, we have also the, the activists 
also inspired by some Christian ideas, um, more ecological, um, uh, to more be friendly to animals, to, to be more friendly to the nature, that we have to, to, to uh, save animals, we have to save the nature because the God gave us them, okay? So that's my question here is, um, um, what do you think about this? That's, do you agree that the religion might inspire very different, even more, say, very contradictory style of thinking, styles of behavior, practices uh, in, in farming, in, in, in economic and social uh, life, attitudes to nature, etc., etc. So this is one, one question to you, kind of the direct. Uh, may I just uh, now uh, formulate my, my remark? And, and you, you mentioned uh, on one of your slides that probably we, we, we have to study more the peasant farm or family farm as a kind of the ethos. And it seems to me that uh, it is exactly what, what, what Jan Dauwe um, uh, makes in his uh, publication, starting from this um, um, uh, idea of the Dutch peasantry uh, to neo-peasantry uh, in contemporary uh, world. So that's, it is also the, 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 the question to, to, to Jan, um, do you agree that, that in fact, in all these publications, you just study uh, peasantry as a kind of the ethos based on autonomy, based on the um, um, uh, challenge to, to, to the empire, to the dominant uh, global forces all over the world. So that's, that's, that's my question. So the first question is to pardon, the second question is to Jan, as, as well as, as Pat, because he introduced this idea of the peasant farm or the family farm as an ethos. Okay, Pat, could you start? Yeah. Oh, okay. thank um, you. yeah uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, if I think about uh, this um, if from a denominational point of view, from the point of view of uh, of churched religions, uh, yeah, I actually, I hope that there's a lot of diversity out there um, uh, from a from an academic side of point of view, uh, this will be helpful to have find difference between Catholics and Lutherans and Baptists and Mormons uh, uh, and, and so forth, and within those kinds of communities uh, as well, where those religious uh, denominations tend to be uh, aggregated. Amish uh, might be the group that comes to most to mind in the United States. Um, so, uh, yeah, the denominations and the, the, the work in the sociology of agriculture and the religion and ecology movement um, uh, have a, when I take that broader work, it, it comes back to a question of uh, this tension in almost all world religions, it seems, of uh, whether we're stewards of this planet uh, or whether we're masters of this planet. Um, uh, the uh, uh, I, I might go back to an early publication that kind of inst instigated some of this field of religion and ecology by uh, a historian named White, who argued that Christianity is the uh, cause of the ecological crisis, uh, that the Christian view of dominating the earth, it's a compl more complicated argument, but that view of domination uh, and control uh, is the cause of our ecological crisis, but that we're not going to resolve that ecological crisis without religions, without religious uh, involvement. And that actually kind of instigated part of my interest in teaching this uh, to uh, our undergraduate students. You can beat them over the head so, so long, but many of them are very religious. And it's been uh, kind of amazing the extent to which some of these students, uh, very conservative uh, Baptist students and so forth, recognize a, a, a retelling of uh, the story of Noah's Ark. Uh, what is Noah doing here, right? Um, he's saving animals from extinction in the midst of climate change. Um, but 
uh, that way of thinking about it denominationally is is one aspect, what we can take from the different denominations. But I'm also interested in a very more uh, uh, fluid understanding of of religion. It, and, and, and to talk to farmers, it seems to me that the farm people that I know will, and I think Jan was perhaps suggesting this, it, it doesn't need to come from the denominations. It doesn't need to come from scripture, from the theology. It can come from the experience, uh, the experience of birthing animals, uh, of, uh, of that uh, process, of the uh, of the plants growing and nurturing them and so forth if if we're can that be ritualized can can we can we sort of re-sanctify that and i have to exp- i'm not a luddite um i'm not against technology but uh to some extent that technology always interferes it seems with that connection that intimate connection that farmers more than most of us have uh with uh with nature um, uh, so some of that is perhaps pulling it up from, uh, from the nature. Um, uh, and yes, I, from my point of view, I'll be interested to hear what Jan has to say, but from my point of view, yes, this is what Jan <laughs> is talking about an ethos, um, uh, of peasant agriculture, uh, the, what, and a repeasantization is a, is a new ethos, uh, and so on. Um, uh, and I, if I might ask Jan to comment on that, if he's in agreement that it is about his work has been about this ethos, uh, how is that, what is the worldview that's connected to that ethos? This literature would suggest that that worldview and ethos also have to be in some sync with one another. They also have to be, uh, in a, in a solid relationship with one another. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay, Jan, would you like to react right now a bit? Yeah, yeah probably I can add a few uh, elements that might uh, be useful uh, to you and to the others. Um, in the exploration of different uh, farming styles, our research group here always uh, has given a lot of attention to cultural repertoire. Each style is coming with uh, a specific cultural repertoire, and there is a lot of ethos time and again in this cultural repertoire. Cultural repertoire is about how the job is to be done properly, yeah, how farm is to be. It's it's normative, uh, and it's. Uh, loaded with ethos. Uh, hence, people can talk about the beauty of the farm, about a job very well done, about a, a promising crop uh, that tells you that uh, people dedicated themselves uh, very much. I mean, looking to the fields and to the animals is uh, used as uh, in order to, well, to indirectly assess whether people have done their job in the in in a well done way uh, uh, so and this the doing the job uh, well translates uh, to relations how do uh, farmers have to relate to the others in the farming family but also how do they have to relate to uh, the land to uh, to the soil to soil biology uh, um, uh, how can they further unfold uh, the land, uh, enrich it instead of destroy it? Uh, uh, how are uh, people to relate to animals? Uh, uh, how to be, uh, how to integrate and deal with the theme of sustainability that is become also very much an ethical issue, of course. Uh, uh, how to relate to the other people, to the consumers, uh, yeah, how to to take responsibility for your products and indirectly for uh, for your consumers. This is all important, and <clears throat> at the same time, uh, as we all know, uh, this ethos has been well uh, put to the to the margin uh, during uh, the large period of modernization. 
<coughs> modernization indeed uh, was a deritualization uh, in this respect. Uh, yeah, just take the market and technology as normative uh, uh, and, and as ordering principle and forget about the rest. Uh, and well, I have the same position. Uh, I'm not against the technology. You, you have to take it time and again seriously and to see how uh, whether it, it is a skill-oriented technology or a mechanical technology, uh, the first allowing people to to, to care for, uh, to be a stu steward, as uh, uh, Pat indicated, to be a steward for the land, for the animals, for the crops, uh, or be a manager, as in the case of uh, mechanical technologies. Uh, I give you a little detail. Uh, we used to have... Uh, uh, experimental farms here open for the public for many excursions uh, from all over the world and at the right at the beginning there was uh, one experimental farm high-tech farm uh, combined uh, next to it to uh, uh, a low-cost farm and in the uh, high-tech farm uh, that was run milking was done uh, uh, by uh, milking robots and uh, I have uh, been working as a translator for a while uh, uh, in that experimental farm, guiding around the Spanish and uh, Italian groups, uh, other groups from all over the world. And what struck me was that uh, nearly always women, when seeing these uh, milk robots, seeing this automated milking, uh, expressing their disgust, they didn't like it. Uh, well, men had another attitude. So this, this again, is indicate uh, uh, technology uh, raises, activates uh, different uh, normative frameworks. Anyway, let me return to the issue of uh, ethos. Uh, you could say there is a rediscovery now uh, of, uh, among farmers, among new entrants, uh, 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 farmers themselves, peasants trying to find new ways forward. And this again relates very much uh, with the notion, with the concept of, uh, of co-production, understanding that farming is not just whatever process of technical conversion, converting uh, inputs into output, but it is dealing with living nature. It is an encounter with living nature. Uh, it's an, uh, the mutual transformation of both man and living nature, and this uh, this this re-evokes this re uh, once again uh, a kind of ethos. Uh, so I, I stop here, but with this last observation, I, I indicate yes, it's it is to be very much on our agenda. Uh, the inquiry into these new uh, in this search for, for, for ethos, in the rebuilding of ethos uh, and uh, using it as an uh, ordering principle in, in the design of, uh, of farming activities uh, and their development uh, through time. Thank you. Okay, um, many thanks, Jan, and I see that Ruta Spivak is ready to uh, make a contribution to our discussion. Ruta, go ahead. Well, all those issues you raised uh, in your presentation are very interesting, and there is so, such a broad, uh, broad number of topics. Uh, I would like just to say the little thing is that the labor issue you mentioned in Poland is not anymore like that. It's just ideal, ideal vision that you can, you know, find easily exchange of labor. It's more and more mar marketized, and the, the the labor is based mostly on uh, on em immigrants. But this is just my small comment. But referring to the last ex exchange of your thoughts, I'm wondering how much, how really, uh, what you describe is it really things that are go are just so the niche, yes, because most of the farms and most of the farming systems is really mm, not tackling the issue of nature very well, as, as, at least in Europe and United, in EU and United States. The, the data shows that there is a decreasing, uh, decreasing le decre the, the level of, uh, for, for example, soil degradation is increasing in, in, in Europe or the number uh, so and so on and so on and also the the big farms as uh, 
Professor van der Ploek says in his book, uh, is just the, the number of the in, the, the, the size of the farms is increasing and the number of owners is decreasing, which means that the farmers farmers are farms are mm, more and more uh, owned by the by the big companies. So I wonder if all this all the all, all this conversation you say about living nature and ethos is just more a discussion about niche and maybe some some way of wishful thinking. I, I have to say that I love all these ideas and I'm, I, I feel I, 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 I like it, but I still feel that this is something we don't describe the real world at least in our in, in in part of the world we live in okay uh, many thanks who who's gonna start Jan or Pat because the question is for for both of them Ruta. I might yeah okay. I might start um, okay. I, uh, yes perhaps it is only uh, a, a niche at the moment um, and um, I'm partly saying that maybe sociologists can uh, begin to excavate what might be latent even uh, amongst um, even uh, commercial uh, farmers uh, along these lines. I don't have a strong answer to that question yet. Um, uh, it's always, this is always going to have been an uphill struggle where um, we're up against very powerful uh, forces in the world that are carrying uh, the uh, the obstacles uh, uh, to this. Um, uh, I, I hate to put it this way, but it might be perhaps that there's a beginning to recognize even among uh, American commercial farmers some of the limits of functional compatibility of the kind of farming we've been doing. Um, uh, and uh, and the future. Uh, climate change, uh, to the extent that it is beginning to be talked about a little bit more, to beginning to be understood, the impacts of that uh, on uh, farmers, even if they are partly responsible for it. Um, I, I come partly from Iowa. I lived a part of my life in Iowa, and the dumping of pesticides on the fields for the last 40 years is now in the water tables, um, that it is now a problem in more and more communities because farmers have to drink from these wells. The Christians have actually taken up some, uh, even evangelical Christians have taken up some of this in a very interesting twist um, by arguing that this pesticide contamination of the wells is a right to life issue. Um, uh, which really kind of flips <laughs> the way we think about things. So, um, so no, it's an uphill struggle. I, I would, I'm not saying, and it, and it perhaps exists in the niche. And but what I want to, I guess, what I would want politically to happen, and can, sociologists can help this, is to make those niches more open. But that's a that's a struggle too because of this bifurcation problem. Because the middle gap is the middle is disappearing. The capacities for that movement from that that other that niche sector to the commercial agricultural sphere is is more and more difficult. I would say. Okay, uh, many thanks, Pat. Jan, would you like to add anything? Uh, yes, probably we can argue that this. Uh, uh, this issue uh, emerges because uh, because many of the uh, feelings of dissatisfaction, of worry, of concern uh, are vetoed, are moved to the margin, are considered to be uh, illegitimate. I myself am convinced that in many places there are these so-called niches, uh, they are scattered throughout agriculture, but they are hidden and they are badly understood. Uh, they come down to, to farmers trying to do testing out new things in, in some corners of their fields, uh, discussing uh, in a birthday party or in a meeting, uh, some elements that uh, 
do not belong to official talk of the uh, farmers' unions. Uh, uh, it, it's widespread, but from an analytical point of view, there are two uh, problems. First, there is as yet no language in which these feelings of discomfort uh, uh, and and the the yearning for alternatives, for new guiding images, for a new ethos. Uh, can express itself, yet there is an urgent need for a new language. Uh, uh, but it's it's not yet there. Uh, and as uh, Patrick uh, rightly argued, probably we can, as uh, sociologists, uh, play a, a role in it, a modest role, but at least in, in shaping uh, the expressions that can people help to, to bring forward uh, both their dreams and their frustrations. Yeah, everything that is outside on the other side of the commodity circuits, yeah, the positive things, the negative things, but uh, you need a language to express it and to communicate with others uh, about it. And as yet, this language is not there. And uh, when it is expressed, it is uh, considered to be stupid. It is to, uh, considered uh, to be... Uh, well, talk of people who do not understand about farming, it's talk of uh, urban people, of youngsters, uh, etc., etc. It's, it's even a bit criminalized. Yeah, It's talk of people who do not understand farming. So this is the first point. And the second point, probably related with this, is that uh, as yet there is no uh, uh, point of articulation for, yeah, an institutional point of articulation for, for for uh, that what is uh, uh, germinating at the level of these niches. Uh, yeah, the farmers' unions are not interested in to, uh, bringing it to the fore. Uh, state agencies are not capable to do so and are anyway unwilling to do so. Uh, a few exceptions apart, uh, sciences are not willing, are not interested in, in helping to uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, who knows, maybe again, uh, uh, here the religion, the churches can, can play a modest role. Uh, it would not be for the first time that they can help us out of uh, an impasse. Uh, uh, let me conclude with that hopeful uh, detail uh, that the Pope, uh, the recent Pope, uh, invited a delegation of La Via Campesina, now already a few years ago, and joined with them a little a mystica. Uh, I now remember the word of this ritual of the Via Campesina. Uh, so this is not changing the world. It's a nice symbol uh, that, that things are changing. So please be careful with the word niche, that the classification of niche is part of the problem. Yeah, it 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 brings uh, it it reduces uh, many things, many feelings, uh, and many expressions to uh, to the to the world of uh, the uh, irrational. Yeah, of the world of things having no uh, feasibility. Yeah, in economic terms, etc. So, so be careful with that and try to see what is happening uh, nearly as a kind of subterranean uh, movement, uh, a little bit as in the, the Goethe, Lalanda type of uh, meaning. Yeah, the subterranean feelings, looking for language and looking for points of articulation. Okay, many thanks. You brought this point forward. Thank you. Many thanks, Jan, and uh, well, we are running almost out of time, so that my final question is, is there any person who wants to say anything at all? at all? I want to say goodbye to all of you. I promised my wife to do the cooking, so I now urgently <laughs> have to run home. If not, <laughs> that's the okay, correct okay. ritual. Thank yeah. you. Goodbye, all of you. Okay. So <laughs> have a nice evening. <laughs>
Okay, let me let me just say say a few words um, right now. I I just want to thank uh, um, to three categories of people. The first one is those people who help uh, me to prepare this this volume based on the re uh, results of the project. And well, I just um, enlist them. Thanks to Spishek Dronk, to Anya uh, Jaschembiec-Witowska, uh, to David Ritter, uh, to Adaś Dąbrowski, to Grzegorz Foryś, to Marta Klekotko, um, uh, to Maria Kotkiewicz, to Maria Łódzka, to Adam Mielczarek, to Piotr Nowak. Um, uh, many thanks also to uh, Jan Dauwe and Patrick Munei for their contribution to the volume, as well as their contribution to our today workshop. Many thanks also for the speakers, uh, Henrik Domański, Ola Wagner, Ilona Matysiak, and uh, Ruta Śpiewak. And uh, last but not least, special, special thanks to Olga Maciejewska with her, for her technical assistance during our uh, today workshop and uh, the operation on these uh, teams. And I think this is the my final word. I think we will be able to meet next time in a real world, not on teams. <laughs> Guys, many thanks and see you next time simply. Many thanks and goodbye now. <laughs>